Hasanabi corporate. I don't even know what that is. Um, I have an update on the uh, $1 million that we have raised thus far. The CEO of Tiltify has DM'd me. He said, hey, Hassan, congratulations on breaking $1 million. As a quick update, fortunately, I found out that the PCRF, the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, and MAP, Medical Aid for Palestine, are already current clients, so we have reached out about the fund transfers. And then we have separately outreached to the contacts at Anira and the Palestinian Red Crescent Society, or Palestine Red Crescent Society, through our contacts at the ICRC to get the paperwork we need, hoping to start initial fund transfers next week. So funds are going to be deployed next week. All right. Start the video call. This. Okay, here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Zach Foster's in the building. Uh, he is a PhD at Princeton and a historian of Palestine. How else would you uh, explain uh, yourself? I don't know. Like, how would you how would you talk about your credentials in the matter here? Yeah, I'm a historian of Palestine. Got my PhD in Palestinian history from Princeton University in 20, in 2017, and I write a newsletter called Palestine in Your Inbox, which you can access at PalestineNexus.com. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, we've I, I've I've looked into I've used uh, the the information you posted about the the development of Hamas, and and how uh, how Hamas became uh, the the formative uh power uh despite being a, a marginal uh islamist fundamentalist muslim brotherhood cutout that was uh, originally a, a a um a charity organization and uh i thought that that was very instructive and uh you know for that you know a bunch of people had posted uh, some of the information that you put out there now this video that we're going to watch from travelingisrael.com which i thought was just simply an israeli tourism uh youtube channel has been going viral for the past uh five days it's already got three million views in five days and it is a video that uh everyone has sent me over and over again saying hassan you have to you have to look at this like you know, everyone is using this video. Everyone is talking about this video. And I thought uh, there's no better person to have uh, explained this video than uh, someone such as yourself, considering your background. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is what you have studied. So I feel Sorry. like this, this will be um, a, a more productive conversation than just me looking at it, especially because, like, obviously I have... Uh, a lot of of areas of weakness as it pertains to the history of the Israeli nation state's development. So, um, without further ado, let's get started. You can this hear it, right? When I play this, be interesting. Even if yes. you have heard a thousand different reports okay. about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I promise you that this will give you a new perspective. I will be talking about the settlements, the occupation, the two-state solution, Islam, Jerusalem, the solution, and a whole lot more. Before I break down the Palestinian narrative, a small trigger warning, I like facts. If you don't like what I'm saying, then bring me facts that contradict what I'm saying. If I say that Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran or that the Jews said yes to their partition plan in 1947 and the Arabs said no, or that there was no such thing as the Palestinians in the 18th century, then so cool. Uh, I like that he immediately starts with facts and then goes directly to the Quran, and and uh, you know, no disrespect. I mean, look, I I was raised Muslim, but like, I I don't know about uh, pointing to uh, religious text to to make justifications uh, that are fact fact based, but then also immediately follows that up with 1947 partition plan and how Palestinians were the ones that said no. And I feel like that is um, a lie by omission, especially considering what was happening in the lead up to that and also what happened in the immediate aftermath of that, uh, specifically the Nakba, which I assume he is not going to bring up. Do you have any additions on that? We don't have to pause here. There's a lot going on in here. There's so many problems with this video. I've, I've, I would limit myself to maybe just 10, 15 points in the video where he's, he's just egregiously lying. So I think maybe we can keep going. 
Okay. Feel free to prove me wrong. I'll speed it up. Send me a link to a letter from a pilgrim to the land of Israel who says that he met a nice Palestinian. I'm asking you to challenge me. If you just write me that I'm Zionist or that I'm biased or that I've received money from the Israeli government to make this video, those aren't actually arguments. And for your information, I am completely against the current government of Israel. The good thing about Israel is that, unlike most of the Arab Muslim countries, Israel is a democracy. I'm not afraid of the government preventing... Okay, okay, no, 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 no. Okay, I'm sorry. This is something I hear from uh, liberal Zionists in Israel <clears throat> that they do not like uh, Itamar Ben-Gavir, they do not like Benjamin Netanyahu, they do not like the Likud party. And yet, so quickly in the same breath, they say Israel is a democracy. I fundamentally disagree with the notion that you can be a democracy while uh, being an apartheid state. Israel, not by my own uh, uh, assumption, but by every single human rights organization's assessment, is an apartheid state. Um, I think that that is 100% a fact. So you can't be a democracy and an apartheid state at the same time. ...me from expressing my thoughts. Israel is not Iran or Syria or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Gaza. And I don't delete comments. Some people are 100% for Israel and some are 100% against it. I'm aiming for the middle ground. If I get dislikes and smart comments, then I know that this video has reached the right audience. But you know, do give this video a like and subscribe. The last thing that I want to ask is this. Don't use bombastic language in your comments if you don't have the numbers to support it. Ethnic cleansing is a very powerful expression. If in 1948 there were around 700,000 Palestinians and today there are 7 million in the land of Israel, you can't really use this term. However... Oof. You should pause there. You should pause there. Yeah, that's, go ahead. What are you going to say? Yeah, so <clears throat> I would encourage everyone to read an article that was recently published by a guy named Oren Ziv in the magazine Plus 972. And he documents with great detail um, the ethnic cleansing currently happening right now in the West Bank. You have um, multiple uh, communities, pa Palestinian communities um, in the Jordan Valley that are currently in the process of being ethnic cleansed. And at least four communities have already been ethnically cleansed since 2019. The first uh, group was um, uh, from an area near the Taiba Junction. Um, in May of 2022, 200 residents were ethnically cleansed from Ain Samia. Um, their homes were dismantled and they fled as a result of settler violence in those Settlers are obviously supported by the Israeli military. In July 2022, another 100 person community was ethnically cleansed from Ras Atin, which is also a Palestinian community in the West Bank. And then again in August 2023, you had 88 residents who were uh, ethnically cleansed from El Kaboon. They were forced to abandon their homes um, as a result of settler violence and settler terrorism. Uh, the, the name um, here, I can, I can share the article with you if you want here. It's called. The title of the article I'm referring to, it's called, It's Like 1948, Israel Cleanses Vast West Bank Region of Nearly All Palestinians. I also would like to add one uh, addition to that as well. Um, this, this opinion is, is here. I'll, I'll, I'll try to simplify it. Uh, you came in with the facts. Uh, I, I have a very simple answer for this. Uh, it is not necessarily about uh, the population growth in and of itself, but about what the population growth would remain in Palestine. If 700,000 people were expelled during the Nakba, now the current population of, of Palestinians in diaspora and Palestinians living in occupied territories and also inside of Israel is at 14 million. Of course, the population keeps growing under horrifying circumstances as well. Um, pointing to the numbers in Gaza, where uh, populations have, have uh, the population has increased to say there has been no ethnic cleansing is akin to uh, is akin to Holocaust denial. But also one other uh, one other argument that I will make is that an Israeli Holocaust scholar Raz Segal has decried uh, Israel's assault on Gaza as a textbook case for genocide. So this is an opinion shared by journalists, but it's also an opinion shared by, you know, formative scholars that have dedicated their entire lives to covering the Holocaust. But, you know, he's a YouTube guy, this guy. So maybe he's, maybe he's on, on the money here. But make no mistake, when conditions worsen, that does not simply mean that uh, people are just going to cease to exist. As a matter of fact, 
when economic conditions worsen, the likelihood of, of increasing the population and, and having more children becomes apparent. That's why when you look at the when you look at the life expectancy in Israel proper, or when you look at the birth rates in Israel proper versus the birth rates in Gaza, um, you you see a, a uh, difference in the numbers there. That does not mean that there isn't an ongoing ethnic displacement campaign and an ethnic cleansing campaign specifically in targeted neighborhoods that you just brought up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, just to add one last point, I think it's not just the West Bank where you're seeing ethnic cleansing happening. You're also seeing ethnic cleansing happening in Jerusalem, in the neighborhoods of Siloan and Sheikh Jarrah and other parts of Jerusalem. You have ongoing ethnic cleansing campaigns in which many families, and this is what triggered the May, 20, May 2021 war, if you recall. You had 58 Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah who were being expelled from their homes. Why were they being expelled? Because they were Palestinian. Um, there's a 1970 law that says Jews can return to homes previously owned by uh, uh, Jews before 1940, but Palestinians can't. So it's a discriminatory law. It's a racist law that allows Jews to take over Palestinian homes. And that's happening across Jerusalem. It's happening in the West Bank, in Hebron. It's happening in the Jordan Valley, in near Humsa. So it's happening all. It's happening actually inside uh, you know, 48, Palestine 48 as well, with Bedouin communities in the south that are being ethnically cleansed as well. And now, of course, with Gaza, you have a million Palestinians, uh, even more Palestinians than were ethnically cleansed in 48 are now currently being cleansed in, in Gaza. So th this point he, he, he says here that Israel um, is not ethnically cleansing Palestinians is just a straight up lie. Yeah. Uh, one that is not supported by Israeli scholars either. Um, just propagandists, Prager U videos, Ben Shapiro, uh, charlatans in general, hacks and charlatans. However, if you want to use the words ethnic cleansing, you can do so to describe what happened to the Jews in Arab countries. In Morocco, in 1948, there were 265,000 Jews. Today, there are around 2,000. In Iraq, there were 135,000 Jews in 1948. Today, there are fewer than 10. Algeria used to be around 140,000 Jews. Today, there Yeah, I, I, I yeah. think I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Yeah, so Iraqi Jews are well integrated into Iraqi society, really, you know, well into the 1940s. Uh, um, uh, th there's credible evidence that suggests that it was actually Zionists that planted bombs in certain Iraqi synagogues uh, that, t t uh, that were placed in Iraqi synagogues to, to scare and, and blew up and killed a bunch of Jews that scared Jews into leaving Iraq. Um, so I'm not really sure why he's emphasizing the Iraq point here. In, so in certain other cases, th there's no question that Jews faced retribution uh, in their own home countries as a result of um, as a result of, uh, you know, the Zionist uh, project and as a result of Zionist uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in 48. But um, it's not, he's not really doing himself any favors by talking about the case of Iraq, which I think the evidence suggests was actually the Jews that did, did more so than the, than the Iraqis to, 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 to scare them into, into fleeing. Yeah, and also uh, Jewish migration. I mean, this is a time of, uh, of like... Um... Arab nationalism uh, rising. I'm not going to say that there wasn't uh, there wasn't contention on the ground in in the uh, post colonial formations here. Some of which were still under colonial occupation, just by not by the Ottoman Empire, but instead by France or England, uh, where uh, you know uh, there was certainly a lot of uh, there was certainly a lot of revolts, riots, and purging. Um, except this. Uh, also favored, as far as I understand it, the, the Israeli state's uh, goal of making sure that they could populate Israel with as many Jewish people as possible, um, which also, like you said, points to the, the uh, situation in Iraq, um, which uh, you're not alone in this assessment. Avi Shlaim also says he has proof of the Zionist involvement in the 1950s attack on Iraqi Jews. A British Israeli historian claims in his new memoir that Mossad cr carried out the bombings to drive Jews out of Iraq to hasten their transfer to Israel. Should we continue? Yeah, let's keep going. There are fewer than 50, and I can go on. It is Muslim countries who perpetrated ethnic cleansing on the Jews. But this statement doesn't quite cover what has been happening. Muslims have been doing this to all minorities, not only to the Jews. If you zoom out, you will see that 100 years ago, there were many Christian communities and other small ethnic groups in the Middle East. They are all being wiped out by Muslims. For some reason, the Western world, the Christian world, doesn't want to talk about it. As a Jew, I... That's ridiculous. I, like, there's also a lot of voluntary migration happening to Israel at this time as well, which is ridiculous because, like, 
Jews can go back to Morocco right now. This is true. There was a robust and large uh, Jewish community in Morocco. They could go back to Morocco right now. They could live in Morocco as, as much as they want to. Uh, but no such, uh, no such uh, opportunity is, is afforded to Palestinians who used to live in, in historic Palestine and want to return back to their, to their homes, their ancestral homes. Right? I, I feel like this distinction is important. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think especially towards the end of the video, his 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 bigotry towards Muslims really shines, um, you know, where he's just really making blanket statements about all Muslims and, and kind of, you know, just the state of Islam today. And so I, I would pretty much disregard everything he has to say about Islam and the Muslim world. It's it's really it's really hateful and bigot, bigoted what he's saying. I mean. And it honestly has nothing to do with the broader point of the video, which is that which is about Israel Palestine. It's just it's a case and it's sort of a textbook case of what aboutism. This whole point here about you know what why is it that no one cares about other people in other places? Well, it's sort of like well why why don't you care about the Uyghurs? Why are you making a, vi a video about Israel Palestine? Why not the Uyghurs? You know, well it's like well that, yes there there are a lot of other problems in the world, but like you're making a video about Israel Palestine, so let's talk about Israel Palestine. Yeah care about what is going on with Jews all over the world. And I find it very odd that Christians don't really care about Nazareth or Bethlehem, which are kind of important to the followers of Jesus and used <laughs> to be 80% Christians 50 years ago and now are 80% Muslims. The same goes for Christians in Syria, Lebanon and Egypt. In Nigeria, Muslim <laughs> organizations have murdered thousands of Christians. Two million Christians have fled Iraq and become refugees in the last two decades. But I like bringing up uh, Lebanon when uh, making a video about Israel as though like, uh, you know, and, and talking about the conflict between like Christians and Muslims in Lebanon while having a conversation about Israel, especially because of Israel's personal involvement, up close and personal involvement in massacres that occurred in refugee camps and in predominantly Muslim neighborhoods at the hand of Christian fascist phalangist militias that, that the IDF personally sent over to slaughter as many Palestinian refugees and as many Lebanese uh, Muslims as possible. Ridiculous to, to just like overlook that notion as though, you know, as though Israel's hands are perfectly clean in that matter. And many of the other uh, instances where Israel's leveled entire fucking Lebanese neighborhoods, uh, you know, it, it's just, the reason why I'm stopping on this is because uh, as, as far as like, him claiming that he likes facts it is uh ridiculous this is any this this has to be a a lie by omission at this point uh if you are to uh, act like you care about palestinian lives or, or or muslims or christians in that in that area i mean there's far greater uh harm that is con has conducted has been conducted at the uh, at the hands of the idf at the as the idf overlooked and deliberately uh uh facilitated the the uh, Sabra and Shatila massacre, for example. No one seems to care about them, neither the media nor the universities. Everyone is obsessed with the Palestinian <laughs> refugees. Did you know Queers that the UN for has two agencies for that. refugees, one for hundreds of millions of refugees all over the world, and another one called UNRWA, which is only for the most privileged refugees on earth, the Palestinians? That's... <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh. Well, one thing I would point out here is that <clears throat> the, this refugee agency, UNRWA, was established uh, in the aftermath of, uh, short, shortly after World War II, when <clears throat> the Jews faced persecution by uh, Nazi Germany, and millions of Jews perished. And, and I think one of the reasons, by the way, why, um, by the way, the UN and the United States at the time never really said much if, uh, about the, the creation of the Palestinian refugees. There were even like New York Times columnists on the ground in Palestine that were reporting on what was happening. And uh, the New York Times chose not to publish some of those articles. There was essentially, a there was essentially, I think, owing to Holocaust guilt and owing to guilt on the part of Americans and Europeans, there was a desire not to speak out against what the uh, Zionists had done to Palestinians in 1948 and, and also kind of give, give Palestinians sort of maybe uh, some extra special treatment in the UN. Um, that that's a, an argument made by Ilan Pape of, uh, of recently. So, um, you know, it, it's like, well, you're not you're kind of leaving out a lot of important facts to the story. It's ridiculous to say that Palestinians are the most privileged refugees and not recognize that the UN um, has a special refugee status for Palestinians due to the 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 inception of the Israeli state and and the 
you know, ethnic displacement that occurred. Um, but of course, I like that he says this is the Israeli perspective you've probably never heard. And this is literally the perspective, the only perspective that I've ever heard. Uh, you know, so I don't know why he's saying that. I've heard the, I've heard the UN uh, special privilege refugee status uh, uh, so many times by people that, uh, that want to defend uh, Zionism who never talk about why these Palestinians became refugees. Like, how did that happen? Did they materialize out of thin air? Did they just become refugees uh, due to, I don't know, some, some volcano or, or uh, a natural disaster? Or was it uh, the deliberate e ethnic displacement in the hands of Zionist brigades, some of which personally called themselves terrorists, as a matter of fact? Okay. Don't just take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. So let's talk about the story the Palestinians like to tell and the media like to repeat. The Palestinians lived in Palestine for hundreds of years. They lived peacefully alongside a small Jewish minority until the rise of Zionism, a colonialist movement which under the umbrella of the European imperial powers started kicking the Palestinians out of their land and homes, causing the current situation. And now for the facts. In the long history of the land of Israel, there was never such a thing as a Palestinian people until the 20th century. Millions of pilgrims have come to the land of Israel over the last 3,000 years. They've come across Jews, there. Arab, Christians. Right, actually, let, let's just finish this thought. Let, let him finish this Muslims, thought and then we'll, we'll, we'll comment. They've never met a Palestinian. Now, you might say, regardless of whether they have existed as a nation, all people should enjoy human rights and all people should have the right to identify themselves but. as they wish. <laughs> and I agree. You have the right to identify yourself however you like, but you don't have the right to reinvent history. And the history of the region is very clear. This is probably the most documented piece of land on the planet. There is a very good book, a very ancient and popular book about the connection of the Jews to Judea. It is called the Bible. Now, wait, wait, I know what you are thinking. He's going to say that God gave this land to the Jews. And now, if you believe that God gave this land to the Jews, great. And if not, also great. The undeniable point is that there is a strong connection between the Jews and the land of Israel. There are thousands of books from the last 3,000 years some point? that write about Jews and the land of Israel. I'm going to tell you, and it's going to say something that's false in a second. Uh, in archaeological okay. digs, we find Jewish coins, Jewish texts. Yes, we, oh, we know this they're ancient. Oh, sorry, well, go we ahead. We know they're, right? well, it, it's just sort of all irrelevant. Like, nothing he's saying is really that interesting right now. Everything he's saying is well known. And yes, there were ancient Israelites that lived there 3,000 years ago. It's not really relevant to ethnically cleansing Palestinians in 48 or slaughtering 3,000 Palestinians in the last 11 days. It's just not relevant information. He's just kind of, you know, telling you that things that they just don't, don't have any significance today. But there's a point he's about to make, which is false. So if you just let him finish this point. Oh, about the coins? There isn't a single no, book or piece of archaeological evidence that point to a Palestinian people. You don't like what I'm saying? Then prove me wrong. But he well, <laughs> I mean, you know, if you believe that your right, uh, your 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 right to ethnically cleanse is dependent on whether or not your great 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 grandfathers and grandmothers lived in this country three thousand years ago. Then I suppose you, you make a good point. Or, however, if you believe that your you know um, your political legitimacy is dependent on you know whether or not you respect international law and whether or not you have a free and fair democratic system, then you know it's completely irrelevant. So I, I just he, he's just kind of spewing off a Zionist narrative that is just sort of disconnected from the reality today. A um, couple of conversations that I've had on this, a uh, couple talking points that I've brought up on this against this very uh, common uh, claim is that one, um, 3,000 years of history is not a justification. Uh, what is the time frame that is like, uh, what is the time frame and, and how long you've lived there uh, where it's completely justifiable to go to an area and just you know, kill all the people that live there and like forcibly expel them from their land. Can the Native Americans come back and kill every single American in neighborhoods with uh, militarized brigades and and then uh, forcibly, uh, you know, forcibly expel them from uh, the the cities that they live in? Is this the basis of a land back movement? Uh, of course not. So that's number one. Uh, no one would consider that to be justifiable. Everyone would understand that that's ridiculous. Also, not a single Native American person advocates for this kind of thing. And they have a far closer history to uh, having permanent ownership of this land uh, than the Israelis do uh, in their justification for it. So that's number one. Uh, number two, the 
Um, the other side of this is the the notion that there is a a, a religious pretext for why this land is important to Jews. And when you look to uh, the the fathers of, of Zionism, like Theodore Herzl, and uh, you know who was, uh, as far as I understand it, a secular uh, Jewish person, uh, and and the different areas that they looked at to create a a self described colonial movement, a a nation state for Jews all around the world, um, they looked at. I think I believe Antarctica is one of the the, the edge cases, Uganda Argentina. and also Argentina. So the notion that this was Israel and Israel always, and it was supposed to be in historic Palestine, is yes. I mean there were attempts made. Herzl went to the Ottoman Empire to uh, purchase the land originally, or uh, to to uh, develop Israel as we understand it there, and uh, uh, he was of course uh, told no. Um. Uh, not Antarctica, Alaska, sorry. Uh, I said it wrong, my bad. It was Alaska, I apologize. So the idea that this is like anything but a colonial movement is disputed by the, the founding fathers of said movement that openly said that there were native Palestinians living there at the time and that they would actually uh, prove difficult to expel and also that this was a colonial movement in general. I would just add one or two points to that because he's about to say in just a minute or two that Zionism was not a colonial movement. And what's really interesting is that, as you correctly pointed out, the Zionists themselves talked about the colonization of Palestine. They use that word, colonization, colonies. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, for example, you have institutions called the Jewish Colonial Trust, the Palestine Jewish Colonization Society. And what's even more interesting is that one of the earliest and, and most important and most uh, significant Zionist, his name was Arthur Rupin, who was basically in charge of the Zionist office that was based in Palestine and Jaffa prior to World War I. Um, and so this guy, Arthur Rupin, so he's born in Poland, and, um, <clears throat> and so he, he saw what was happening with the German Colonization Commission. And so you, because at the time during his upbringing, the German colonization com commission was basically colonizing his hometown and his home area, his home region, which was called Poznan. And, and so the, basically what the Ger German government was doing at the time, they were settling farmers on land that was bought from Poles in order to transform the demographic character of Poznan and West Prussia from Polish to German. Okay. And so this actually was a source of inspiration for Rupin, and he explicitly talks about it in his memoir, and, and that, that you know he was basically you know um, he was inspired by German colonization efforts in Poland. In fact, he even hired a former official of the German Colonization Commission to advise on how to best transform the demographic character of Palestine from Palestinian Arab to Jewish. So this idea that Jew, this idea that Zionism is not a colonial movement is something that obviously most Zionists wish was true because colonialism has a bad rap these days. But the fact is, Zionism was a quintessential colonial movement. And in fact, it was a quintessential settler colonial movement. Um, and so, you know, it's just, he, he's just spewing propaganda at this point. But we'll, we'll get to that point, point in the video very shortly. Yeah. It is much more than that. The connection of Christian and Muslim to Jerusalem is based on the Jewish connection. Jesus was Jewish. And the connection of Muslim to Jerusalem is also based on the Jews. Let me explain. I will go even further and say that Jerusalem was never the capital of a Muslim empire. It was always Cairo, Damascus, or Baghdad. Jerusalem was mostly important to the Muslims when they were fighting against the Jews or the Christians. Under Muslim rule, Jerusalem was often a very neglected city. This makes sense as Jerusalem, which is mentioned some 600 times in the Jewish Bible, isn't even mentioned once in the Quran. Chapter 17 of the Quran talks about the night journey of Muhammad. He ascended from Al-Aqsa, which means the most Again, far away I, I, mosque. I would just say How that it... all this history that he's narrating right now is completely irrelevant. Like, whether yeah. or not Jerusalem is holy to Jews or to Christians or to Sikhs or to Buddhists has nothing to do with ethnically cleansing Palestinians in 48. It has nothing to do with dropping bombs and killing 1,500 innocent Palestinian civilians in Gaza in 2014. It has nothing to do with 50, 40 years of occupation. And, uh, you know, so it's just, he, he's kind of, it's just like, dude, what, why are you telling us all this? This is just not relevant to what's he, happening he's, today. He's trying to pad the stats because uh, contemporary history proves him uh, to, or... Uh, any defense of the the Israeli nation state to be uh, pretty morally repugnant, in my opinion. So that's precisely the reason why he's like going back to three thousand uh, three thousand years of history, which is 
not an argument you could ever use for any other for 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 any movement whatsoever. There is not a single serious like land back movement advocate that would make this same argument. Like they would never they would never do that. They would never use that as a justification. No serious advocate would ever push for this to ethnically displace people that have been living on land for hundreds of years at this point. So it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, it's just just cruel. I, I don't know. That's Come it. to be associated with Jerusalem. In order to understand this, you need to go back to the Jews. The Jews had two temples on what is now known as Temple Mount. The temples were located on the holiest site for the Jews, which is the top of Mount Moriah. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the second was destroyed by the Roman Empire. Sixty years after the Romans destroyed the temple, the Jews rebelled again, and the Romans changed the name of their region from Judea to Palestina, and this is how the name came to be. It was intended to disconnect the Jews from the name That's Judea. a lie, by the way. I don't think it's worth getting into, but th th there's, this, there's, this, um, there's this myth among Jews that you know, Hadrian put down the, the, <clears throat> this revolt that, you know, remember in, in 135 CE, you have this uh, revolt by Bar Kokhba, who's revered among Zionists and Jews for, you know, resisting uh, Roman rule. And this, as so, so the story, go, the, the mythology goes, you know, he, in order to, you know, eventually erase, you know, the name Judea from history, he replaced it with Palestine. I have a whole, uh, I've written about this in my PhD dissertation. That, that's just a myth. There's no actual evidence to support that. It, it, it's basically just been propagated by Zionists and Jews for the purpose of claiming that basically even the name Palestine itself is somehow like somehow like some le yeah. illegitimate name. So, but I, but it's just it's just total nonsense and propaganda. Even the history itself. I mean, if you actually look and in, dig into the sources of like, did Hadrian change the name from Judea to Palestine? The answer is we don't know. It's just it's just mythology. Well, I think it's also projection because. That is precisely what uh, uh, the the Zionist brigades ended up doing after the Nakba, as they uh, as they gave uh, uh, Hebrew sounding names to uh, formerly Arab villages, uh, and and you know, and and basically destroyed all of the Arabic structures in certain villages as they planted uh, European trees on top of them to permanently uh, destroy any semblance, any cult, like any. Uh, there was a period of like I guess de-Arabization is that a, a proper term for it I don't know um, where they were uh, they they tried to completely remove uh, the the Arab culture in that area and that wasn't three thousand years ago that was you know around 1948 so or in and in, in the aftermath of 1948 in the inception of the Jewish state so remember that. 700 years after the destruction of the temple, the Muslim colonized the land of Israel and said that Muhammad ascended to heaven from the place where the Jewish temples stood. Now, at this point, you may well be saying, what? The Muslims believe that Muhammad ascended to heaven from the exact same spot that is the holy site for the Jews, and this is not written in the Quran? Yes, and if you find it strange, that's because you don't know Jerusalem. Nothing makes a place more holy than competition with another religion. The Muslim took the place which was the holiest for the Jews 1,500 years prior to the existence of Islam and made it their third holiest place. Don't believe me? Here is a pamphlet of the Waqf, the Muslim authorities that say that this is the location of the Temple of King Solomon. Although what I'm saying here is very basic history, there is a good chance you don't know about it. And I don't blame you. You hear so much about the conflict, but the media tends to forget the basics. Jerusalem was always the center of Jewish life. Muslims turn their back on Jerusalem when they pray towards Mecca, and Jews pray towards Jerusalem. When Jews get married, part of the ceremony is to say that we will never forget Jerusalem. Jews have almost always lived in Jerusalem, even under the harshest conditions. Since the 13th century, the Muslims haven't allowed the Jews to pray at their holy site, the Temple Mount, and the Jews have <coughs> had to pay extra taxes and... Stuff. Wait, since the 13th century, they haven't allowed Jews to pray at the Temple Mount? Is that true? I thought that the Ottoman so, Empire, especially after the Ottoman control, it was like uh, this area was was uh, where, where Jewish travel was perfectly permitted. So, so this guy's just he doesn't really understand Judaism very well because to most religious authorities, the most halachic uh, authorities, it is forbidden for a Jew to go up to the Al Aqsa Mosque compound to uh, to enter into what what used to be the Temple Mount. Why is that? 
Um, do, uh, the, the reason is because um, in ancient times, in biblical uh, times, um, the, the, the Jews went and prayed at, at the temple, um, at, at the temple um, during three times a year. And, and, and the holiest year, day of the year on Yom Kippur, the, the, pre, the, 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 you know, the chief uh, Kohen, you know, the, the, in the ancient world, the, the ancient Israelites had Kohanim, were basically the priests. And once a year, the, 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 like, the, the head of the Kohanim would go into this room called the Holy of Holies, Kodesh Kodashim. And this person, who's the holiest Jew, was only allowed to enter this one place once a year. And, the, and, and Jewish f of, uh, uh, theology had it that if any Jew were to ever walk into that room and any other day other than that one year, it would be immediately killed because that's the holiest site, that's the holiest spot in Judaism. And, and so only one person is allowed to enter that room once a year. And so if you actually ask most ultra-Orthodox Jews today, even many Orthodox Jews today, even many conservative Jews today, they will not enter the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. They will not even go up there, okay, out of their own desire not to accidentally cross over that Holy of Holies place, that Holy of Holies site. So he's just, I mean, like Jews themselves have like, you know, basically decided on their own accord not to go up there. So I, I just, I'm not even really sure what he, why he would even bring that point up. It's just not really relevant again. Um, yeah, patting the deck. Suffer harassment. They have even had to pay the Muslims a fee to pray at the Western Wall, the closest to the it, Temple Mount. There's, a, there's another point here that, that I would make, which is that I think most historians agree that Jews fared much better in uh, Muslim lands <laughs> yeah. under Ottoman rule than they did in Christian uh, Europe. I mean, this is a point Ridicu I think pretty much accepted I, by I, all. I hate yeah, that, yeah. I hate when they fucking, look, uh, not to be too Turkish here, okay? Because, you know, I, I shit on Turkey quite a bit, the Turkish government quite a bit. But that is pure ahistorical nonsense when you fucking act like the Ottoman Empire was not always a fucking safe haven for Jews historically oppressed by... Uh, pogroms everywhere. Uh, they they escaped Spain and came to Istanbul. Uh, Morocco was another place as well. Like these are these are the notion that like um, the notion that Arabic populations have always been anti-Semitic is a really dangerous myth that is entirely removed from any kind of historical context whatsoever. Jewish people. And Arabic people, including Arabic Jews in general, why is there Arabic Jews is a question you should be asking, uh, have always uh, coexisted in, in far better conditions than they did in Europe. And, they, and than they did in, under Tsarist Russia, for example. So it, it's very frustrating. Uh, did they pay a tax? Uh, yes, they did. Just like Christians did. Just like all non-Muslims did. But they fared far better and, and had far better conditions always. All right, I'm going to move on. They were allowed to pray. The Islamization of Jewish sites hasn't only happened in Jerusalem. In Hebron, one of four cities that are holy to the Jews, there is the Cave of the Patriarchs, which according to tradition is the place where Abraham was buried. To humiliate the Jews, Muslims didn't allow them to enter the building, and Jews were only allowed to walk up to the seventh step. Only in 1967, when Israel liberated Hebron, were Jews allowed for the first time in 700 years to enter the second holiest place for Jews. Why do I say liberated Hebron and not conquered? I will get to that in a minute. And now we get to the interesting part, the 19th century and Zionism. Jews have always migrated, or as we say in Hebrew, gone up to the land of Israel. In the 17th would and 18th right there, centuries... Cause that's a lie. So he's fundamentally distorting Jewish history. He's, he's trying to picture that for, for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, Jews have always been, you know, as, as he said, Jews have always migrated to the land of Israel. I mean, this is just total nonsense. Again, if he knew anything about Jewish theology, he, he would know that he's just spewing myths and propaganda because for the overwhelming majority of Jewish history, it was actually um, forbidden for Jews to migrate to Israel. Um, and, and the reason was very simple, which is that in the end of j days, Jews have eschatological beliefs, just like Muslims and Christians. And the, 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 the eschatological belief among Jews is that Jews should not e live, let alone move to the Holy Land, until God decides so. It's God's yeah. decision. Belief that they, Jews believe that human action to hasten the arrival of the Messiah violated Torah law and therefore you're not not only are you not allowed to live there you're definitely not allowed to move there and so you know he, he's kind of really distorting jewish history here it's it's really a grotesque distortion i would say 
Yeah, the uh, the Orthodox, uh, you, you see it in like uh, the Torah Judaism account all the time chat, uh, the, the Orthodox Jews that are still uh, anti-Zionist, uh, this is where they're coming from. Uh, this is this is what they are uh, stating when they when they say that uh, Jews are not supposed to have a land, they're not supposed to have a nation state until the Messiah comes. Um, that's the reason why uh, some Orthodox Jews, not all, of course, uh, there's varying degrees of thought there, uh, are are some of the most <laughs> some of the most serious anti-Zionists. Jews came from all over the Jewish world, from Europe, from North Africa, from Yemen, in small numbers due to the harsh condition, but there was always a steady movement of Jews coming to Israel. The first Zionist Congress was held in 1897, but 50 years beforehand, in the 1850s, there were more Jews than Muslims in Jerusalem. In the rest of the land, yes, there were more Muslims, but it is important to know that even before the start of the Zionist movement, there were dozens of Jewish settlements in the land of Israel. In the last decades of the Ottoman Empire, as in all empires, there were lots of different groups. Some groups got bigger with time, some smaller, some bought land, some sold land. Many European powers bought land for institutions, and some groups, mostly Germans and Americans, settled in the land of Israel to speed up the second coming of Jesus. Many different groups, none of the groups... Damn, I'm, I'm glad that he's saying that. I mean, that's this is actually, unironically, a perspective that most Americans are unfamiliar with. One of my favorite, uh, uh, you know, reasons as to why there are so many Western settlers, so many American evangelical Christian groups uh, fund these uh, these these uh, Zionist projects, specifically settler expansion, because they want to speed up the rapture. You know, that's it's cool that it, there, there you go. We found one truth. He said one thing. He, he brought up one genuine truth that. In most circumstances, people do not know about or, or share. Use the word Palestinian to describe themselves. The first Zionist Congress took place in 1897. The Zionist movement was a national movement, not a colonialist or an imperialist movement, but a national yeah, we one. Already debunked that one of bit. many. Yeah, we already, yeah, we already covered that part. It was part. the age of the fall of empires, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, and of the rise of national movements. And the Zionist movement was the national movement of the Jews. It is as simple as that. In the first half of the 20th century, millions of people moved from one place to another. Yeah, I think it's a... I make this distinction quite frequently. I wonder what your perspective is as a historian. Like, I talk about post-colonial nationalist movements being very different than, like, an established nation-state engaging in a nationalist movement. The difference would be, like, Germany versus, like, pan-African national... Uh, uh, na pan Africanist movements or Pan African nationalist movements, like uh, that are that were uh, launched against uh, colonial occupation. Like nationalism as a means of emancipation is very different than nationalism when you've already established a nation state. And um, for the the Zionist movement to simply be considered a emancipatory nationalist movement, it would have had to existed under colonial occupation as a well-established group of individuals and not like 3% of the population total in historic Palestine that peacefully coexisted alongside uh, the majority Muslim and Christian population, right? Yeah, I mean, Zionists like to call uh, Zionism a national movement. I think the more accurate historical framing is that it's a settler colonial movement. And what do we mean by settler col uh, colonial movements? You have many of them. They, you know, to Australia, uh, to to the United States, to the Americas, um, to Canada. And I think what what makes settler uh, colonial movements uh, settler colonial movements is that the, the the people who are leaving their home countries have made a decision to um, basically to sever their ties with that country. And that's why they're settler colonial movements rather than um, j just colonial movements. Because you know you have lots of colonies. You had a lot of you know colonies all around the world. In most cases, those uh, co c colonists wanted to preserve their connection to their home country. That was not the case in in, in the Z with Zionism. In fact, and that's that's why some scholars have even called settler uh, Zionism a like. You know, an ideal type of settler colonialism because, you know, more so than almost any other settler colonial movement, the Zionists said, you know, fuck Eastern 
Europe, we're moving to Palestine and we're not going back. Whereas many British colonizers and many you know, uh, French colonizers who came to the New World actually wanted to preserve their connection to their home <laughs> countries. So it, strictly speaking, you know, when, when you actually, if you ask scholars to say, like, what is the most ideal type of a settler colonial movement? I think Zionism ranks very high on that list. Other yeah. to create nation states. What's special about the Jews is that they never stole or used violence to take any land in the land of Israel. I'm always getting comments from Muslims and pro-Palestinians about Jews stealing the land from the local Arabs. Here is a challenge for you. Give me the name of one village that the Jews stole from the Arabs from the 7th century when the Arab Caliphate colonized the land of Israel until 1947 when the Arabs started a war to wipe out the Jews from the year. We can pause it if, 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 to talk about this because this, first of all, I think this whole, like, strictly speaking, I, I, I don't have any, like, uh, disagreements, but he's kind of, he's seeing, he's losing, what's that expression, like, you, you lose sight of the forest for the trees, so... The only reason Zionism came into existence was because of the because of the use of force by the British Empire. Okay. Yeah. You have to realize you have to realize that you know the, the the overwhelming majority of the local Arab Palestinian population rejected Zionism and Zionist immigration and Zionist land purchases. In fact, you even had an American commission, the King Crane Commission, show up to Palestine in 1919 and, and ask the locals, you know, w do you support a Zionist program? And 85% of them said no. We reject Zionism. But of course. The local, uh, the democratic will of the uh, of the indigenous inhabitants of Palestine was irrelevant to the British. Yes. So, and, and the British exerted a tremendous amount of force to suppress that will, and they and and, and any protest and, and they suppressed protests with violence, and they and they completely ignored the, the the petition submitted by the Palestinians. So it was, of course, through the use of force, of course, British force, you know, uh, uh, but but nevertheless, for a tremendous amount of violence and force that brought Zionism into existence and, and enabled Zionists to migrate to Palestine. So again, he's, he's kind of using facts to distort history. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no land was stolen is, is wild. I mean, it's, that's a wild take. That's, that's a wild take to, like, to look at uh, settler uh, expansions happening in the West Bank right now, today, when we're, you know, as we're having this conversation. But it's certainly a wild take, especially when you look at it from, uh, from the lens of, of the, the Israeli nation state and its development. Um, but I, I guess it's like, it's myth-making in, in a sense, right? Like, because that's why some historians will dispute the Nakba being like an organized effort by militant brigades that were that were trained by uh, the, the British colonial occupying force at the time uh, and that they specifically had information detailing uh, each Arab village and its occupants and, and points of entry and whatnot that they immediately seized on or started seizing on even before while the British occupation was, uh, was, was still occurring in historic, I mean, British mandate Palestine and, uh, you know the reason why they uh the reason why this is, is something that could be even disputed i guess because one they uh the the israeli government refuses to declassify this information despite the fact that 50 years have passed um and we're actually nearing 25 additional years on that 50 year uh, uh passage of of time so that they could de declassify this information but also that's this is the reason why they could say oh well uh, they they left on their own volition. The Arabs left on their own volition, as a matter of fact. Uh, there was some back and forth fighting, but the Arabs ultimately left on their own volition, which is ridiculous and ahistorical. There are still people who uh, participated in said purges, violent purges, including the Deir Yassin massacre, the, one of the most famous ones, uh, both at the time and also uh, throughout history, uh, where that one 95-year-old uh, Israeli army IDF reservist who participated in that Deir Yassin massacre is still trotted around despite being a psychopathic terrorist who committed unspeakable crimes in Deir Yassin, uh, uh, who, who uh, the Israeli government still uh, sends uh, over to the troops to uh, you know increase morale, as they say. Anyway, silly. 636 till 1947, not a single square foot was stolen by the Jews. Again, if you don't like what I'm saying, then prove me wrong. Give me the names of villages that Jews stole prior to the War of Independence. On the other hand, I can give prior you lots of war, names of... Prior to the War of Independence.
I'm sorry, my mom is here. Um, yeah. So what? What? I mean, what's happening? Do people just leave, leave on their own volition? How did that work? Yeah, I mean, I think when he gets to forty-eight, it's really telling because he spends about six seconds on the most important moment in Israel Palestine history. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. I think one thing to remember here is history and and telling narrating history is all about what you emphasize and what you omit. Right? That's the case, you know, and 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 that's the case with whenever anyone's writing the history of anything. And so, you know, I think that kind of tells you everything you need to know that he basically glosses over forty eight as if nothing happened. But anyways, we'll get to that point. All right. Jewish villages that Arabs or Palestinians, if you will, destroyed before nineteen forty eight. Take Hebron, for example. Jews lived in Hebron for hundreds of years. In 1929, the Arabs, not one or ten, but whole gangs of Arabs, murdered 70 Jews, and the ancient Jewish settlement had to be abandoned until it was brought back into Jewish hands in 1967. You want more names of Jewish villages that were abandoned because of Arab violence? Here are some more. Many were rebuilt after a few years. The Arabs used violence against Every single one of these is like uh, the 20s Arab revolt, right? Against uh, the British occupation for the most part as, as uh, they recognized that they were slowly being displaced by a colonial uh, occupying force that was purposefully, purposefully ridding them of the land and, and trying to engage in ethnic displacement, which they were right about, by the way. Their means and their methods might not have been, but their, their suspicion that they were going to be inevitably displaced ethnically was absolutely correct. That's why Israel exists in the way that it does. And... The the uh, arguments that I guess he's pointing to are those villages, right? That's he's saying like, look at look at all these villages that that uh, displaced the uh, uh, Jews that were living there. Yeah, well, look, I would say that he, he he's really distorting history here. I mean, if if you if you I was reading pretty recently uh, in, about the Jaffa riots of 1921, and. <laughs> You know, according to at least a, a number of accounts, you know, Zionist gangs basically, you know, um, uh, sort of entered these neighborhoods in Jaffa that were Palestinian. And, you know, there are many accounts where they started harassing Palestinians and, you know, uh, threatening them and, you know, basically like, uh, you know, exerting their, you know, uh, control over Palestinian neighborhoods. And there were, uh, there were clashes of violence and, uh, you know, violence broke out. And l little, little do you know, like some Zionists got killed, but it's like the Zionists were actually the aggressors in those cases. But again, he, he's not interested in, in trying to understand what happened, right? He's not, he has no interest in understanding what happened in the Jaffa riots in 1921 or, or in the Nebi Musa uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 demonstrations in 1920. He's not trying to get at the history. He's just plucking out little factoids that sort of paint the story he wants to paint. But and so it, it, this is just a classic case of propagandist. I think if you were to teach a class on propaganda, you would use this video to illustrate what propaganda looks like rather than some like actual serious narration of history by a historian. Yeah, I, I do want to point out that I'm not I'm not saying it was justifiable in any meaningful capacity to uh, to to forcibly uh, engage in any kind of pogrom or any kind of ethnic displacement, whether it be Palestinians or Jews at the time through uh, violent revolts. But uh, the 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 party that was defended by and militarized by the colonial occupation at the time and in British mandate Palestine were uh you know were were absolutely uh, way more militarized than the than the arabs were at the end of the day which is why the uh 1948 nakba panned out in the way that it did all right let's continue Jewish civilians in the land of Israel many years before the occupation and many years before the land of Israel was established. And by the way, they didn't only use violence against the Jews. Christians suffered as well. Remember the German and American settlements I told you about? They suffered as well. The family of John Steinbeck, the American novelist, had a farm outside Jaffa, or at least they had it until Arabs broke in and murdered Steinbeck's great uncle and sexually assaulted his wife and his daughter. Here is an interesting anecdote. That's Okay, I'm sorry, but when you're talking about when you're when you're getting to 1947 and talking about like Arabs sexually assaulting and murdering villages, like the numbers are on the board. Okay, it's six thousand total in defensive uh, or six thousand Zionist uh, forces killed 
in comparison to the uh, in, in comparison to the conservative estimate of fifteen thousand Palestinians. Okay, some of which uh, led to the entire villages leaving, thinking that they'll be able to return, never to be able to return as well. And the atrocities were were absolutely unimaginable and numerous, uh, even ones that we uh, have have uh, knowledge of due to the fact that. Those veterans are still alive to this day and will openly reveal the things that happened. And the victims, in some instances, are alive to this day. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's. I don't know. I, I feel like that's uh, very disingenuous to, to point this out and, like, invoke John Steinbeck. Do you have any take on this? I was not familiar with this event. I didn't bother to look into it. I, I, again, it's... He, he's pl he's plucking out little factoids that paint a picture that the Palestinian Arabs were, were you know just violent rapist sexist. It's just incredibly dehumanizing when you leave out all the other facts that you know actually Zionists committed all these mass atrocities against the Palestinians. He's just painting a picture that dehumanized Palestinians. Yeah, it, I mean, dude, this this being portrayed as not only this being portrayed as not only like by by I feel like historians uh, uh, that that talk about this sort of thing, talk about what happened in the lead up to the Nakba and after, uh, will at the very least paint it as like a both sides affair. Whereas this guy doesn't even do that. He just completely removes uh, the, the atrocities committed by uh, Zionist brigades. He completely removes that from the equation. Doesn't even talk about like the violence that British people were subjected to, which by the way, they fucking deserve it. Let's be real. I mean, but... But even like uh, uh, even even the the bombing of the the hotel by I think it was Irgun or was it Lehi, uh, one of the one of the terror cells at the time, like blowing up a hotel and, and numerous other positions as well where uh, you know there were uh, there were British uh, military officials when uh, when when they uh, tr tried to stop uh, mass immigration of Jews from coming into uh, the the British mandate Palestine so. <clears throat> it's uh it's odd not to mention any of those things and simply to say that like uh you know arabs were going into settlements and and killing people and 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 raping them when the reverse of that happened at a systemic level in the hands of a much more militarized trained experienced force that was at a certain point i think i believe more than 100,000 strong some of the some of the groups literally had experience fighting in combat in World War II against a bunch of Arabs that did not have any kind of real uh, way of, of, of defending themselves, uh, had a, a severe lack of, of weapons to be able to defend their villages, and in many instances, like Deir Yassin, did not even believe that uh, their villages would be attacked because they had a truce pact with Jewish villages in their surrounding neighborhoods and therefore did not think that they would even need to militarize their neighborhoods and have, uh, you know, standing guards and, and uh, any kind of militia presence whatsoever. One thing I would add here um, <clears throat> to the point that he's using facts to distort history is that one of the reasons Zionist militias were so successful in 48 in expelling all of these Palestinians from their villages was that in the preceding decade, um, actually, Zionists, um, you know, were establishing military files and uh, um, uh, dossiers on every single Palestinian village. Yes. Elon Pape, Elon Pape writes about that in his book, Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine in 48. And the reason those Zionist, uh, those Zionist agents, spies, let's call them, were able to access those villages is because they were invited in and welcomed by the Palestinian Arabs. Yeah. In fact, to, to, their, to their own fault, actually, they, they were, were quite open and, and you know, open-minded to the Zionists. And this goes all the way back to the 1880s and 1890s when many of the Zi first Zionist agricultural col colonies failed. And it was actually only through Palestinian Arab assistance that many of them were, were able to even survive in those early few decades when the Zionists were from Eastern Europe. They didn't know how to farm. They didn't know how to uh, tend to their uh, uh, animals. And so actually Zionist, so, so a Palestinian Arab assisted at Zionists in, in, in those early decades, and then also were, were, were generally speaking open and welcoming to, to Zionists, even Zionist spies and agents in the yeah. decade prior to 48. So again, he's using facts 
to distort history. The, the history of Palestinian Arabs is actually one in, one which was quite, you know, again, I think to, to the fault of the Palestinian Arabs, more welcoming to Zionists than it should have been. Yeah. Um, for the record, it's not just Ilan Pape, but, but also people are still alive from uh, people that survived these atrocities or perpetrated these atrocities are still alive to this day. And this is, in spite of the Israeli government's best efforts, information that you can access directly by hearing it from uh, the, the militia forces, the veterans that were formative in the establishment of the Israeli state, um, specifically as far as uh, the, the um, intelligence officers that you mentioned that were gathering information on surrounding Palestinian villages. Um, some of them are, are entirely conflicted about their participation in the onslaught. Um, uh, 1948 Creation and Catastrophe is a great documentary that uh, that looks at and and directly uh, uh, interviews veterans on the uh, on the uh, the Israeli uh, the the Zionist brigades at the time and also the Palestinian veterans uh, that uh, took up defensive uh, positions at that time as well. So these people are still alive, you know. Yeah, Irgun and Haganah uh, are are uh, the the two two formations that they. have still have veterans that are alive that, you know, they went and, and asked about. There was a guy by the name of, I forget, is a Mordecai something, but he is the one who, uh, he is the one who, who gathered all of the intel on Deir Yassin, who uh, he then saw the atrocities committed on his intel and was, uh, and, and openly talks about how devastating that was for him, not realizing what would happen. Now you might not believe him, but I mean, that is, uh, uh, Vanunu Mordecai. I think is that his name? It might be. Uh, hold on. Let me let me just make sure. I don't know if his no. I don't think it's Vanunu Mordecai. Um. Anyway, whatever. All right. Let's continue. It's not Vanunu Mordecai. Two other great American novelists, Mark Twain and Herman Melville, visited the land of Israel. And like hundreds of other pilgrims, they wrote about how neglected the land was, and many wrote about how violent the local Arabs were. From 1970 we'll to pause real quickly there, the because no serious historian uses these uh, memoirs of American racists to tell the story of the local Palestinian Arab population and what they thought and what they did and what they believed. In fact, historians today... Um, you know, uh, um, they use local sources. So, so they use local Arab sources. Um, they use memoirs of Arabs. They use diaries of Arabs. They use Islamic Sharia court records of, uh, produced by Arabs. They use Ottoman records produced by the Ottoman officials. But, you know, he, he, like, it's just, you, you kind of, you're discrediting yourself when the, you're explicitly telling your story of the history of the Palestinian people through the lens of these American travelers who spent a couple of weeks in the Holy Land, didn't speak a word of Arabic, had the Orientalist images of Arabs in their head, and were incredibly racist by their own, according to their own writings. So it's just, it's just strange. He's just, he's just discrediting himself by citing these sources as like the, the you know, what you should like as like evidence of like Palestinian beliefs of anything. Yeah. British and the French were in control of the Middle East. The Jews blamed the British for being pro Arab and the Arabs blamed the British for being pro Jewish. I will tell it as it was. The British were pro British. They had two main interests in the region. True. To have oil. Okay, never mind. He's right. Okay. There, there you go. I, that's the <laughs> second fact that I agree with. By the way, like. You know he, how he said the Jews blamed the, uh, the 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 British for being pro Arab until 1936. That's just a straight up lie. I mean, yeah, you know, I, 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 like uh, from 1920 to 1936, the British and the Zionists were like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, I, I, he, he's just he's just wrong about that. Yeah. Um, and I I would yeah. I agree. From Iraq and then, the and then things started to change in 1940. But, but even then, like. Anyways, yeah, we yeah. Keep canal it, it's not open. that interesting a point. And because both of these interests lay in the hands of the Arabs, they were pro-Arab. Today, it is very fashionable to be against colonial powers. And of course, they did do a lot of damage. But uh, I find it absurd that pro-Palestinians are anti-colonial, as it was the Roman Empire that gave the name Palestine to the area. And 
This is ridiculous. Okay, dude. Yeah, no, for real. Everyone has the right to invade Africa because, uh, you know, we all came from Africa. Like, come on. Come on. It's so... It's I mean, ridiculous. It's ridiculous. He's really, he's really discrediting himself at this point. Like, bringing, bringing the Roman Empire into things, I just... It's like, no, dude, dude, the, dude. It's like, it's like Mongolians deserve the world. Okay, they, it, it's, it's their planet. Actually, all the way to fucking, all the way to wherever they, uh, they pushed the, the uh, Anglo-Saxons or the, uh, you know. I mean, it's like, like they, it all belongs. The Greater Mongolia. Because first of all, we already said that the Roman Empire may or perhaps may not have named the place Palestine. That's a, that's a myth that he's now using as fact. To say that because the Roman Empire called this place Palestine 2,000 years ago, therefore it's strange that Palestinian Arabs are against colonialism. I mean, just think about that sentence for a second. And that's what this guy's telling us, okay? So, you know, I think that sort of like tells you as much as you need to know about how, how much credit we, uh, how much credibility this guy has. Let me has. tell you, I think, I, think it, I think his perspective is revealed when he goes, now colonialism is not fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think that's what that that's what his real perspective is. Where it's like, if colonialism was fashionable, he'd still be like, yeah, this was a colonialist movement, and we liked it. And in it was the British good. Empire that gave it its borders. When the British and the French drew lines on maps, they invented two nations that never existed before: the Palestinians and the Jordanians. Another fact we that is pause right there because is that that's actually the subject of my dissertation research, and he's just full of shit. I mean, he's just straight up lying right there. So his argument, he's saying that. When the British drew the colonial boundaries around mandatory Palestine, they invented the Palestinian people. So um, I, I published a paper a few years ago um, uh, with um, <clears throat> Emmanuel Beshka, a colleague of mine, and we found the term Palestinian in, in Arabic sources something like 114 times from 1898 to 1914. So before there were any British colonizers in Palestine, Palestinians had already been calling themselves Palestinians for two decades. and actually. If you go into Western sources and English sources and German sources and Russian sources, you actually have, you know, the, the term Palestinian uh, is being used already from the 1870s onwards. So he, he's just re regurgitating and repeating lies that have been debunked already for years. Wasn't this partitioning process was also done by, uh, by, by like the, the uh, population centers, right? I thought that. I thought that originally it was like wherever, and even then it was actually, um, it was actually quite unfair when it was like a 50 50 split, despite the fact that Jews at that point had, um, Jews yeah, at that, that point had 20% uh, of the population and 80% was Palestinian. And yet the population split, um, was, was the uh, land split was 50 50. Yeah, th this is, we'll get to that, and he, he, we'll get to 47 in, in a few minutes. But yeah, oh, that's he's, what he oh says I, I misunderstood, right. I thought he was talking about Before, this. Never the mind. Palestinians and the Jordanians. Another fact that is often overlooked is that pro-Palestinians are always talking about Jewish immigrants coming from Europe. No one talks about the Arabs who came to the land of Israel. Hundreds of thousands of Arabs from Egypt, Syria, and other places entered the land of Israel in the 1930s. Yeah, that's a lie. We should pause there, because this was debunked no. already in the 1980s, so... In, in, I think it was 1984, a woman by the name of Joanne Peters published a book called From Time and Memorial, in which she made this argument that he's making right here. That's the source of the argument. Uh, shortly after that book was published, um, <clears throat> Norman Finkelstein uh, took that book and dissected it footnote by footnote, sentence by sentence, and determined that the entire thing was a fraud. She literally falsified documents. She invented facts. She was fast and loose with the numbers because she's talking about demographic data, right? And, and this book was determined to be a complete fraud already in the mid-1980s. And, and, and I would say actually one of the most serious historians of, uh, of the British mandatory uh, period is his name is Yehoshua Porath. He published an op-ed. And this guy, by the way, is, is not really, is no friend of the Zion of the Palestinians. I think he's, a, he's pretty Zionist. But basically he published, uh, similar to Norman Finkelstein, he basically determined that that entire book, literally from beginning to end, was fraudulent. She falsified records and invented documents and sources. And so he's, this guy is, again, here's another instance where this, this guy is just repeating and regurgitating things that have been debunked for 40 years. Okay? And then we can talk, we can address the second point he makes shortly after that. Oh God to work for the British and are now seen these, these as are just native lies Palestinians. Right now, he's repeating. It is hard to estimate the number of Arabs who entered the land.
I will just add one more thing, which is why is it that Zionist propagandists like this guy loved, I mean, repeat things they think are true, but why do they love telling you that it was actually Egyptians and Syrians that moved to Palestine rather than there were indigenous native Palestinians living there already? Why does he love this point, which we already know is, is a myth, but why does he, he wants to tell you that? Because in order to dehuman, again, it's all about trying to erase the Palestinian people, pretend they weren't there, they didn't have a real identity, they didn't have a connection to Palestine, which is part of this broader initiative among Zionists to dehumanize the Palestinian people. That's why he's bringing it up, and I just think that's important to point out. Isn't it also, like, doesn't it also kind of come with a recognition that, like, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's almost like Arabs have lived in that area for much longer periods of time at this point than than and Jews have so he's trying to use like Arab Jews as a way falsely but still as a way to be like no 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 we are native see like we have Arab Jews and and they wanted to move there because they had like a calling to move there like i feel like it it comes with the recognition almost that like um Arabs are more deserving of this land than uh than Europeans Jewish or not, I don't know. Maybe I'm yeah. uh, I'm extrapolating information that is not well, accurate. He, he's about to he's about to say something that is, in my opinion, absurd. Which is, he, he, let's just let him finish this point here, and then I have another comment to make. Okay. Land of Israel between 1917 to 1947 to work for the British as the borders were open, but the number is in the hundreds of thousands. Probably about half of the population of Gaza lie. came to it's the land of Israel. He's just lying. He's just spewing misinformation right here. These statements, there's no evidence to support what he's saying right now. He's just straight up lying. Israel during the British mandate time, their last names usually hint towards the actual origin of the family. I find it absurd that people like my great grandmother, who came to Israel from Eastern Europe in the 1920s after dreaming about the Jewish homeland for generations, are seen as white colonialists, while Egyptians who came to work for the British in 1945 are seen as native Palestinians. Now you might be saying, "Okay, I would pause okay, there. Well, <clears throat> I would pause there because I think <laughs> it's a very insidious point he's making." Uh, there's a key. There's one key difference, by the way. And of course, there were migrants from, uh, you know, from Egypt and from Syria. He's not wrong that there were migrants. By the way, Palestinians also migrated to Egypt and Lebanon and Syria as well. There were people migrating everywhere in all directions. But there, there's something very insidious what he's saying here, which is, he's trying to say, well, you know, what's the difference between an Egyptian and a Zionist? Well, I'll, I will tell you what the difference is. The difference is that, you know, the Egyptians and Syrian migrants. They integrated into local Palestinian society. They spoke Arabic. They went to Palestinian Arab schools. They, you know, participated in, in the Palestinian organizations. They participated in the Palestinian scouting troops. They assimilated. Whereas the Zionists wa did not assimilate, they had no desire to integrate into the local population. Instead, they created an exclusionary society with separate schools and separate institutions and, and with the whole with the purpose of eventually taking over the country. Despite the, the fact that originally Arabs, uh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, but wasn't, Go ahead. weren't there Jews living there already who were not exclusionary uh, inherently in, or in its in, for, for years and years, like the 3% of, of Palestinian Jews living in um, historic Palestine? 100 percent in fact there were great relations on i mean generally speaking there were great relations between arab jews arab muslims and arab christians on the eve of zionist immigration we have anecdotes from the literature amos oz is a famous israeli novelist his father relayed to him an anecdote that he shared in his memoir um, in which you have jewish children and muslim children playing in the same courtyards together okay in jerusalem they shopped in the same street in the same stores they lived in the same buildings um you know they actually celebrated one another's holidays together i know this is kind of crazy to, to to think about but jews celebrated ramadan with muslims um muslims joined jews in places like sheikh jarrah to to celebrate jewish festivals together um you know christians celebrated with muslims and and basically zionism wrecked all that um when you had one one of the populations the jews uh, decide that no, no no this land is jewish land and we're going to control it with a jewish government uh, with jewish institutions and build an exclusionary jewish society on top of this arab land that kind of wrecked the the, the inter the, the harmonious intercommunal relations that that dominated prior to zionist immigration to palestine so yeah you're 100 percent correct there were generally speaking very good relations between jews muslims and christians on the eve of Zionist immigration to Palestine. Um, 
One point to consider here, I don't think you, you use the term assimilation, but I don't think you mean like forcible assimilation, but more so, I guess, um, a uh, trying not to uh, exclude others from uh, the, the culture of the land. It's more integration than assimilation. Correct. That's what I, I, I mean, integration. You know, in other words, wherever you have a population migrating from one place to another, I think the local population appreciates when you learn the local language, when you go to local schools, when you, you know, work in local stores and local businesses, right? But that, the Zionists did none of those things, and the Arab, you know, the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Lebanese did all of those things. Where they came from, and if they have been here for generations, they have the right to self-determination. And again, I agree. In 1947, the UN proposed the division of the land into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews said yes, and the Arabs said no, and then started a war in a bid to eliminate the Jews. The morning after the partition plan, Palestinians attacked Abbas and murdered five Jews. This is how the war was started. They were offered a state, they said no, and start murdering Jewish civilians. Yeah, this is pure garbo. Is, is, I don't think you can find... Is there, is there even like... Um... Is there even a, a dispute? Uh, I, I feel like this is... I feel like to, to say that this was um, Arabs immediately fighting against uh, uh, Jews at this point out of nowhere is is a lie by omission, right? Like, it's, it's well, not like this started in 1948. It, it, that's exactly correct. I think the basic problem with this story, again, is plucking out facts to distort history, which is to say that to pretend like <clears throat> that there wasn't already 20, 30 years of rejection of, of resistance against Zionism, that Zionism, you know, wasn't fundamentally a, a violent movement that sought to displace um, and depopulate the land, I think is, is sort of the history and the context that's being left out here. And I think more importantly, what he does after, you know, he basically says in, in, in the next minute, he, he says, well, you know what, like be, be, the Arabs started the war, so, you know, it's their fault that there are 750,000 Palestinians. Is a class at 750,000 Palestinian refugees. It's just a classic instance of victim blaming, you know, um, uh, especially when you consider that in the years after the war, Zionist forces, you know, the Israeli government and the Israeli military shot live ammunition at the Palestinians who were trying to return to their homes after the war. And, and, and so to pretend like, you know, uh, it's actually the, the Palestinians' fault that Israel, uh, that the Zionist forces expelled 750,000 Palestinians from their homes and then shot at anyone who tried to return their homes is just so grotesque and disingenuous. It's, it's just a classic case of victim blaming. And you're completely leaving out the whole story of 1948, which we'll see in a minute. He just breezes right by it. But he just completely ignores what actually happened in 48, which was 800 and, Palestinians and were massacred. Not even, it's not even 1948. The expulsions had started before 1948, before the expulsions happened under British watch. The, 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 the start of the expulsions happened under British watch. The idea that this is, uh, you know, the idea that this is uh, happening in 1948 is, is ridiculous. There are firsthand accounts from, uh, from British police that were there uh, uh, documenting the back and forth fighting where, uh, once again, a tale as old as time itself, um, uh, the, the Jewish militants were, uh, the Zionist militants were significantly uh, more powerful than, than the, the Arab militias were, which were almost always in a defensive posture in general. The other, the other thing to point out about the partition plan, and I think you already mentioned this, but the partition plan gave, I believe... Um, uh, it gave uh, most, okay, so most of the country was given to the Jews, even though they only constituted, um, I believe, 33% of the population of Palestine yeah. at the time. And, and the only reason they were that, there, there were 33% uh, Jewish was owing to British violence. Um, so, even, you know, but on top of that, they only own 6% of the land. Right, so they they own six percent of the land. They're thirty three percent of the population. The only reason they're that many is because of British violence, even though they get like fifty five, sixty percent of the total uh, surface area, uh, you know, of the total land of of, of British mandatory Palestine. So of course, British, of course, the Palestinians are going to reject that. It's it's completely insane. And and then on top of all that, something like forty, forty five percent of the population of the proposed Jewish state was going to be Palestinian Arab. 
the whole concept of partition was that, you know, Jews, where, where there's majority of Jews, you have a Jewish state. When there's majority yes. of Arabs, you have an Arab state. But actually, Jew, Arabs were like almost 50, per, you know, 40, 45% of the Jewish state. So there yeah. were so many things that were just so incredibly unfair to the Palestinians. No, it was, about it was absolutely going. gerrymandered. Yes. Uh, areas that were uh, predominantly Jewish was mostly Jewish. Uh, whereas Arabs lived, it coexisted with uh, Jewish people in areas that now Jewish uh, uh, forces or, or Jewish villages would be controlled by uh, the the uh, Zionist militias. Yeah, absolutely uh, understandable. Uh, uh, absolutely understandable conflict uh, that would not arise out of nothing. Not a single Jew was spared in all of the places that fell into local Palestinian hands. Luckily for us, after 15 months of fighting the local Arabs and our five Arab armies that invaded Israel, we won. And yes, during the War of Independence, many Arab villagers were destroyed and about 700,000 people were displaced. That's, that's what happens when you try to wipe out your neighbors. You might... So that's what happened, so... That's fucking insane. Yeah, he's also, he's also lying when he says that's what happens when you try to wipe out your neighbors. In fact, there was a pact between King Abdullah of Jordan um, and Ben Gurion during during the war that basically said, you know, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. Um, you don't invade the land that was proposed to the Jewish state and we'll, we'll let you have uh, uh, the West Bank. Um, that that was actually an agreement. So, you know, he, he's, he's just totally wrong about that. In addition to that, the Zionist forces were actually much stronger than the combined forces of the Arabs. And so they got weapons from, che uh, I believe, Czechoslovakia during the war um, and then France shortly thereafter. And so, you know, uh, He's, you know, he's also just blaming Palestinians for being ethnically cleansed by Zionists. So I, I just, I'm not quite sure how anyone can take you seriously when you say that. Yeah, it is unimaginable to me for anyone who has ever read any kind of history of Nakba, even from, even from Zionist uh, uh, writers of the on on the matter, for you to leave that uh, that historical moment thinking like, oh well, sucks to suck. You tried to expel your neighbors, and that's what you get is you have to be fairly cruel to, to come to that conclusion um, because these expulsions early on were horrifyingly cruel by design because, uh, and, and also well-documented, like you said, Ilan Pop is, uh, uh, talked about this uh, and written about this as well, uh, about the, the actual uh, written uh, cleansing in... in um, inside of the, the Zionist brigades, like where they were very purposely, systematically wiping out entire villages, going in, doing horrifying things, and then, uh, and then, you know, letting the word be spread that if they come to your village, if you see, if you see a, a um, you know, Zionist brigade come to your village, you better run because they're going to do the same things to you. Um, the one example that I've used uh, uh, quite a bit is, is really horrifying, but um, this is from uh, first-hand accounts of those who actually survived the uh, atrocities in Deir Yassin, where uh, the, the Irgun uh, uh, Brigade had entered the village, uh, uh, while uh, the, the Arab forces in general were, I think, mourning the loss of an Arab leader in a prior, uh, in a prior attack on a Jewish village uh, in Jerusalem. And, um, and the, the village itself was, like you mentioned, under a pact of of peace a, a peace pact with the surrounding jewish uh villages and did not think that it would be it would ever come under attack a, a, a pact of that this pact would ever be uh violated and um one thing that they did was uh after you know lining up every single person in the village shooting them doing horrifying things you know taking earlobes and and throwing people in wells they they took a father and his son and and stood them in front of a uh, oven, an oven that was burning, and they told the father to throw his son in the oven. When he did not comply, they beat the father up, threw the son in the oven, and then threw the father in behind him. Anyway, um, this is firsthand accounts of some of the atrocities. They took the remaining survivors and brought them back, I believe, to Jerusalem, and paraded them as the people, uh, as the onlookers threw rocks and trash and spit on the remaining survivors uh, from said village until they actually killed the remaining survivors and and uh, kept them around, kept their bodies around for an extended period of time. Again, eyewitness uh, firsthand accounts from not just Palestinians who survived, but also 
Zionist forces that participated in the atrocities and the veterans themselves have, have uh, uh, you know, mentioned this. This is like firsthand accounts from the direct veterans that were involved in it. Uh, so when, when atrocities like that are, are kind of hand-waved away when they played a really significant role in the mass expulsion, uh, I think that you're you're not you're doing yourself a disservice if you are trying to uh, offer us facts about the history of the inception of uh, the Israeli state, right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, also, a reminder that the a lot of the uh, a lot of the militant forces were trained by uh, the British police at the time. And also uh, had weapons, and some literally had combat, like actual combat experience from World War II. Um, so it's, it's very, I feel like that's a, it's a very different circumstance than a bunch of dudes with like whatever stolen guns that they had trying to, to defend their villages. Well, yeah, I mean, and have to pay the price. At the same time, 800,000 Jews were brutally expelled from Muslim countries. For some reason, no one cares about them or want to tell their story. Millions of articles and papers have been written about the Palestinians who had to evacuate their homes because of a war they started, yet very little has been written about the Jews living in Muslim countries who were subjected to pogroms and had to flee, even though they were innocent. Please tell me why you care so deeply about the Palestinian refugees, and yet you couldn't care less about all the millions of other refugees. I don't understand it. Like, they're, they're in Israel. Like, what? They're not currently... Is he saying that, like, the Jews that went to Israel... Are, are refugees still like they they want to go back to you know they want to go back to arab nations but they can't is that what he's saying yeah i mean that's what it sounds like i i don't think very many of them want to go back to their countries of origin but again this is sort of just like a classic case of what about ism um do you want to talk about israel palestine or do you want to talk about what happened in morocco or iraq or egypt it's just like these are different issues and this has been a long-standing Zionist desire to try and bundle in what happened uh, to, 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 to Jews in other countries with the Palestinians. Guess what? The Palestinians have nothing to do with that. They weren't responsible for that. Um, they, they, they were, you know, if anything, it was because of the Zion. I mean, this has been a long-standing problem with, with, in, in, with Zionist history, which is that Zionists commit all these atrocities, and then Jews around the world face retribution. By the way, there's nothing unique about Zionism or Jews. This happens everywhere in the world. You know, where, where if you have a Muslim commit some horrible act in India, other Muslims get, you know, face retribution for that. The same is true, uh, you know, by Hindus. The same is true pretty much in the, in the U.S., right? The same happened after 9-11, when, uh, you know, uh, after the, the towers came down and there was this gruesome attack against American c civilians, you had all this racism and hatred against Muslims in America. You had the same in co after COVID. You had all this anti-Asian hate. Because there was a perception that, you know, it, would, it was a Chinese virus. So, again, this is just like, it's just like, A, what about ism? B, this has nothing to do with the, the you know, uh, Israel-Palestine. So, I, again, he's just, he loves distracting us with things that are not relevant to the question at hand, which is like, what, like, the history of Israel-Palestine and what the Zionists did to the Palestinians and what the Palestinians did to the Zionists. That's what we should be focused on. And he's just kind of distracting us with all these other things. Yeah, I, I I don't understand uh, the argument at the like if I follow it uh, to its logical conclusion, like I guess he's trying to say that like well Jews don't have a right to return to like their nations of origin, and I feel like uh, if there was a united Arab front that got together and 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 dealt with like not the Abraham Accords but something that that actually was conciliatory. And they said every single Jewish person can go back to their nation of origin as long as every single Palestinian can go back to Israel uh, and, and Palestine. Uh, you know, I, I feel like there is 0% chance that uh, that would be popular in Israel proper right now, right? Like, no, I know that it's not popular because I, I hear the arguments all the time. I'm sure I'm surprised he hasn't made it yet about the about the demographic change that would uh, ruin the the robust uh, culture that that Israel has developed and uh, and and numerous other like great replacement theories that that uh, Zionists present as though it's like uh, perfectly valid to say that in the same breath as like uh, invoking the Holocaust and why there needs to be a nation state for uh, Jews there where they have uh, the majority and 
for me, I understand. Like, I, I understand the long and complicated and, and horrifying history of constant pogroms and, and, uh, and, and the Holocaust as well and why uh, Jewish people spiritually would want a, a place to call home. It's just that the counter to that is not a possible hypothetical uh, ethnic cleansing that might happen that is Islamist fundamentalist. Uh, and the only way to stop that is by doing your own uh, ethnic cleansing campaign that is uh, supremacist in the other direction. All right, let's continue. Who had to flee at the same time. 14 million Germans, about the same number of Hindus and Muslims, Ukrainians, Armenians, Poles, people from the Balkans, and I could go on and on. The Palestinian refugees are the most privileged refugees in the world. Some say that the partition plan wasn't fair as the Jews made up one third of their population, but got two thirds of the land. To that, I will say this. The Arabs actually also got what is now known as Jordan. So in fact, the Jews got a much smaller part. And I should oh. also add that the- I mean, that's awesome. This is, such a ridicul this is such a ridiculous point. The Arabs got Transjordan. There were no Jews living in Transjordan. I mean, do you want Jews to be given a country where they don't even live in? I mean, it's just such a ridiculous point. Well, I mean, they did get a lot of land where they didn't live, so <laughs> why not Transjordan too? What do you mean? Which is the reason why what like the original Irgun uh, uh, logo it features Transjordan as well. That's right, it does. Yeah, they they did want that, which turned into Likud, yeah, I, I mean, guess. The Arabs got all the good land. And the Jews got the swampland and the desert land. I mean, this and is now a, I'm going to state a fact. That, that point is also ridiculous, by the way, because <clears throat> the Jews migrated to lands that were swampy because that's where they were able to buy land, right? They were not able to buy land in the mountainous interior to the same extent as they were in the Galilee and the coastal plains. And so, and so they were given the land. And so the, the, when the partition plan was devised, the whole concept was wherever there are Jews already living, that's where we're going to make a Jewish state. And wherever there's primarily Palestinians living, that's where we're going to make a Palestinian state. And so he's just sort of, he's like, well, but the Jews get given the swampy land, but that's because that's where the Jews were living. And that's where the Jews were able to buy land. And, that, and there are reasons for that, which are historical, which we get into if you're curious. But it's just like, it, it, again, it's just like such a ridiculous isn't that, point he's isn't making. That the again, basis of the, isn't that the basis of the, for a people without land, a land without people? Like that's the, yeah. that's the positive, I guess, as far as I understand it, like, yeah, obviously Palestine was populated by people, but there were certain parts of uh, this land that did not feature, like they, they did not have a lot of people in it. And that, that's what the original like uh, kibbutzim uh, formations were, right? I, I mean, like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't always violent is what I'm saying. It wasn't always done through um, violent means. Yeah, I mean, Zionists bought land wherever they were able to, wherever there were Arabs willing to sell them land. And it turns out that they were able to buy land in these areas that were actually somewhat undesirable, right? They weren't um, the places where Palestinian Arabs had large population centers, right? If you look at where the largest pop Palestinian Arab population centers are in historic Palestine, you know, we're talking Hebron, Nablus, Jenin, Jaffa, Gaza, Jerusalem, if you're either talking about uh, Haifa, Akka, you're talking about the coastal cities, and then you're talking about the mountainous interior. But that, those coastal plains in between, you know, where basically Jews were able to buy land, were, were, were essentially the most undesirable land, and that's what the Zionists were able to buy, because that's what Palestinian Arabs were going to sell them. And so he, he's sort of just, you know, he, he's kind of, again, he's, he's, he's losing the force for the trees here. Fact that is definitely going to annoy all the haters of Israel. The Jews took the swamp land and the desert land and made the impossible possible. Oh. We turned the land into gold. Israel is pioneer in Iraq. Oh, the supremacy. Oh, the, the classic, like, Arabs like to yeah. bomb and live in sewage. Uh, Jews like to build shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just stems from a belief in, honestly, Jewish supremacy. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what this is. Th these statements yeah. about, about how, you know, Zionists uh, drain the swamps and... Uh, and turned uh, you know desert into into gold. It's it's just again it's just the belief that we are superior to other groups, and it kind of feeds into everything that's happening right now. It's just the dehumanization yeah. of Palestinians. It also is like always enforced through uh, the the real life conditions uh, that Palestinians are subjected to in Gaza. Like uh, whenever you hear someone say, 
oh, well, they get billions of dollars over the course of like 20 years, and yet they haven't built a singular thing. Or, oh, they busted down the greenhouses and, and blew up the water pipes to make, uh, uh, you know, weapons. And, oh, Palestinians can't get fucking cement into or concrete into Gaza because if they do, then they build tunnel systems and whatnot. And it's like, it, it always is a reinforcement of that same, like, Palestinian Arabs, like Arabs in general, do not have ingenuity. They have no they have no way of like envisioning a better future. And it's not because of the conditions that they were subjected to historically, and instead simply because they are inferior. And that argument is probably very familiar to many of you here in this community because it's fucking identical to the uh, the colonial mindset that white people had when, you know, colonizing Africa and, and many other parts of the world, as a matter of fact. It's a, it's a Absolute justification point. that it, it serves the purpose of dehumanizing your colonial subjects and, and justify all of the atrocities and all of the, the humiliation that you subject them to because they're, they're not as superior as you are. I mean, this guy can try and hide it, but it's jumping out here in this situation. Like, oh, we took the swamps and, you know, made it into gold. What did the Arabs do? Yeah, I mean, it's also, if you think about where most of these European, most of these Jews were coming from, they were coming from Europe. And Europe, over the course of the 18th and 19th century, plundered and colonized the entire world and extracted massive amounts of silver from the New World and plundered India and plundered China. And in the course of all that plundering and colonizing, they became rich. And the Jews of Europe benefited from that. And they benefited from the universities and the wealth that was created in Europe. And then they brought that to Palestine. So kind of in some sense, in some very twisted sense, that, that this is evidence actually of kind of you know, a history and a legacy of European violence and colonialism. Yeah. Irrigation systems and desalination system. Israel invented vegetables and fruits that can grow in salt water and yet taste sweet. As for the Arabs, the large part of their land is now polluted and contaminated. After 1948, the Palestinians... I, I'm not really sure what he's even referencing there. That's Dude. just like straight up racism. Like, the large part of Palestinian Arab land is polluted? Like, where is he even getting... Like, I've never even heard that propaganda before, by the way. So he's like innovating in his propaganda. But like, I, I don't even know what the fuck he's talking about right Dude, there. Dude, that, that is like... It's always so funny because it's like you can be as monstrously racist as you want to be as long as it's like against an imperial enemy. You know what I mean? Arabs, the, the historic enemy of the Western world, but certainly uh, in the post 9-11 world, you know what I mean? Like you could just kind of say whatever the fuck you want about Arabs and people will go, yeah, they're all terrorists, right? Like it's whatever. Yeah, they live in sewage. They live in filth. They, they did it. They, they couldn't. They couldn't make anything. If you said this, and many racists do say this, about black people living in Africa, this would be understandably a white supremacist perspective. It is a white supremacist perspective, yet again, when you say uh, uh, victims uh, of your own constant expansionist settler colonial project are actually um, left behind due to their own... I guess cultural, maybe not genetic, but cultural inferiority. That's what he's trying to infer. That's what he's trying to say here without saying it. It's the classic trick that Ben Shapiro applies when talking about black people in America, where he'll say, oh, it's their culture. It's not their, uh, it's not necessarily, the, I'm not saying they're genetically inferior. I'm just saying they're culturally inferior. There's what, there's, what's so insidious about his point is that you know, he's saying that, you know, Arabs polluted. I think he used the word pollute, okay? And what's so insidious about making that argument is that it was actually recently revealed. There were many rumors and there were many reports of this earlier, but I think the definitive proof is now in that the Zionists used chemical weapons. They poisoned Palestinians in 1948. They poisoned Palestinian wells in 1948, okay? So, and then, by the way, they did this. Same thing in 1970 when, um, you know, th th there was a desire to take over some Palestinian land to build a settlement in 1970. Zionists, th th we're talking about the state of Israel, poisoned Palestinian wells in the area where the Palestinian village was so that they would leave and Zionists would take over. And wow. so, so actually, it's actually the exact opposite of what he's saying is closer to the truth. So different than what's happening now when you see videos of, uh, of, of the uh, Israeli government pouring cement into water wells, you know?
Oh, wait, no, it's identical. And that's what I keep re referring to whenever I talk about this issue is like, since 1948 and even earlier than that, um, the, the tactics of colon settler colonial expansion have been identical. Throughout time, the only thing that's changed is like the weapons have gotten better, the surveillance technology has gotten better, but the overarching fundamentals are still there. It's always the same. Oh, well, you know, we sent flyers in to tell you to evacuate northern Gaza before we bomb northern Gaza, so we push you into southern Gaza and then inevitably offer you a humanitarian corridor to, to leave and, and, uh, and, and live in Egypt, never to return. That's, that's something all too familiar to Palestinians. They've experienced it. They've heard it from their parents. They heard it from their... Fa they, they experienced it with their grandparents that they can never see ever again because if they leave Gaza, they might not be able to return back. Or if they leave the West Bank, they certainly will not be able to return back. This is, a, this is an ongoing reality for them. So ultimately, uh, you know, it's, it's just not much has changed. To understand the, the ongoing cruelty of the Israeli apartheid regime... Uh, you can look at any other moment in time and you will see the exact same justifications of the most moral army and the only democracy in the Middle East. ...to establish a free Palestinian state as they were under Egyptian and Jordanian rule. Yet they didn't do that. In 1964, the Palestinians established the PLO or the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Now this is interesting. 1964 is three years before the Six-Day War. So before Israel occupied the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and before a single settlement was built, they were already calling for the destruction of Israel. When the Arabs say free Palestine, they don't mean we want an independent Palestinian state next to Israel. What they want is a Palestinian state that replaces Israel. The what do you got for that? Oh, we got the babies well, with Hamas. First of all, when Arabs say, anyone who starts a sentence with the words, when Arabs say free Palestine, they mean... Again, is <clears throat> I think overgeneralization would be an understatement. I mean, to paint all people, all Palestinians, all Arabs with a single brush is just like um, racist. It's just ridiculous. Like even if a lot, it's just like um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's sort of hard to it's sort of hard to engage with somebody who has no problem generalizing all people, um, it, it, w painting all people with a single brush. Yeah, no. It's great. It's, uh, yeah, all Palestinians just want to, like, wipe out uh, Jewish people. That's what they want, for sure. Except if you look at, like, any kind of polling, even exit polls from, like, the, the election that ended up putting Hamas in power, uh, <laughs> the exit polling showed, even back then, a secession of, uh, of, of uh, violence and uh, a, a two-state solution. There was definitely points in time throughout the history where Palestinians were absolutely on board with uh, having their own nation state and peacefully coexisting. It's just that, to my understanding at least, and maybe you can tell me I'm wrong, uh, Israel has used that as an opportunity to consistently squash any kind of conciliatory effort from Palestinians that were made in good faith and, and continued its endless expansion, both originally in, in Gaza and in the West Bank, certainly, and, um, and, and continue to expand in uh, the the uh, West Bank uh, still to this day. Yeah, I think what's particularly odd about this footage he's showing here is that it, just a second ago he was talking about the PLO. It, the the photos he's showing here are Hamas. Yeah. Okay. That that green flag is Hamas. Why are you showing Hamas photos uh, in a discussion of the PLO? Remember, the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist in 1989. All the while, he's saying they're, you know, supporting the destruction of Israel. So I, I just, it, it's sort of hard to, you know, deal with these points in good faith when he, he's just, you know, telling you one thing but showing you something else, and painting all Arabs with the same brush, and and just kind of, again, like, not actually sharing any data or any facts or any evidence to support his points, just making these broad, sweeping generalizations. Palestinian kept rejecting all offers made to them from 1947 uh till 2008. This is my favorite. This is okay. Can we talk about this real quick? Palestinians rejected every offer made to them from 1947 till 2008. Um, this is something that uh, you hear from every propagandist hack, every charlatan. This is like, 
I, I assume this is like a like a militarized Hasbro talking point because I I hear it way too frequently. Um, so so what what would you say to that? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think the most generous offer, a quote unquote generous offer made to the Palestinians was in Taba in two thousand, um, <clears throat> between Yasser Arafat and uh, Ehud Barak. Um, the first well, point I may or may not be seeing tomorrow after on on a broadcast that I am going to be on. Yeah, he's um, he, uh, that's very interesting. We'd be curious to hear more about that. But um, you know, but but basically, the first thing to say about this offer is that it was a verbal offer. It was not a written offer. And some analysts say that a verbal offer is not an offer. If you want to make an offer, it has to be in writing. So that's the first point I would make about that. That all these offers. Actually, in, even even throughout the entire Oslo peace process, you know, even in Camp David in 2000, everything was oral. Um, you know, and so that, that's the first point I would make. The second point I would make is that, you know, this quote unquote generous peace offer uh, included the following: Israel was not uh, um, required. It, Israel made no concessions whatsoever on the Palestinian refugee issue. They didn't. They were not. They didn't not even acknowledge taking any responsibility in creating the refugees in the first place. Now let, yeah. let me ask you this: How is it that you expect to be able to come to a final status peace negotiations when you're incapable of even owing up to and acknowledging the crimes committed 75 years ago by? your own state, the crimes that led to the establishment of your own state, your inability to even acknowledge that you took a responsibility and played a role in creating the refugees was a huge, huge non-starter for the Palestinians. That's point one. Point two, um, all of these offers involved Israel maintaining security control of the Jordan Valley and the border with Jordan for a period of at least 20 years into the future. Now, let me ask you this question. How is it that you're supposed to have an independent state and have autonomy in your state and have self-rule in your state when you can't even control your own border? These weren't serious peace offers. There was never an attempt to, to explain how Palestinians would be able to maintain a connection between Gaza and the West Bank. All, that's the third point. Number The fourth point would be the, the offer to, to, that Palestinians would have control of Jerusalem was actually they would have control of Abu Dis which sits actually outside of Jerusalem. Palestinians were never offered a, a, a state, a capital in East Jerusalem, in the part of Jerusalem where you actually have Palestinians living in the Haram al-Sharif compound, in the old, the Muslim quarter and the Christian quarter and the Armenian quarter of the old city. <clears throat> that was never offered as part of the uh, capital of Jerusalem. Um, and they were never, uh, so, so when it comes, and then on top of all that, Israel insisted on maintaining three military outposts in the West Bank. Yes. That part Did, do the Palestinians... Do the Palestinians get three military outposts in, in Tel Aviv and Haifa and, and Jaffa? No, they don't. So the, the, the entire framework was how is it that we can allow for some amount of Palestinian autonomy while Israel still maintaining control of all the land between the river and the sea. And when you understand that that was the fundamental principle upon which Israel engaged in these negotiations, you realize that it was never fair to the Palestinians. These offers were never serious offers. Um, and so, I don't know, I, it's just, you know, I mean, now, I have plenty of criticism for the Palestinians, by the way. They didn't make a counter, you know, Arafat never made a counteroffer at that Taba. So we're not here, I'm not here going to pretend like I have any lost love for, for, for Yasser Arafat. But I'm, I'm telling you that the Palestinians, well, that the Israelis, you know. With, with Camp the, David, quote, quote, with, with, wait, hold yeah. on. With Camp David, it uh, uh, much was written about how Arafat had actually in private conceded, uh, according to American authorities that were there outside of Clinton, obviously, but uh, that that there was actual concessions made uh, from a a Arafat's side. But, of course, they later said, no, we never conceded to anything, uh, even though they had quietly even offered up parts of West Bank as well, as far as I understand it. But then they personally said no in public, far after the deal had fallen apart, in an effort to save face, at least to my knowledge. That's a great point. No, I think you're absolutely right about that. And in addition, I think the other thing to remember here is that the entire peace process was taking place under American 
auspices and, 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 and you know, through American diplomatic channels and using American negotiators facilitating the entire process. And everybody knows, anybody who knows anything about the United States role in, in the Israel-Palestine question knows that, you know, the entire foreign policy team of Clinton, uh, of Clinton's entire foreign policy team were like right-wing Zionists. I mean, you, you know, Dennis Ross? I mean, the, the people leading the American negotiation team were applying an incredible amount of pressure on the Palestinians, while at the same time applying zero pressure on the Israelis. And Diana Butu, a Palestinian, Amer uh, Cana uh, excuse me, a Palestinian Canadian, uh, who, who played a role in the negotiation process, shared some very, very interesting anecdotes recently in a podcast she recorded uh, with, uh, um, I believe, El Maidan is the name of the podcast. We can probably share a link if people are curious. But she explained how. And many of the draft versions that she would be getting of like documents that were shared by the uh, Israel uh, by the Americans, there would be comments left in the margins from the Israelis, like, "Oh, you should you shouldn't say this or you shouldn't say that." There was no light, there was no distance between American and Israeli positions. It was basically the United States and Israel on one side of the negotiating table, and Palestinians on the other. And how is it that you're expected to you know to run conduct negotiations between the most power when your uh, negotiation partner, when when the person you're trying to negotiate with, is the most powerful country in the world and allied with the person who is controlling and occupying you and besieging you for, for, for 50 years. I mean, that's the other point to remember here, which is that, you know, the other, another interesting point made by Dan Abutu is that during those negotiation processes from 2000 to 2006 and 7, um, you know, the Palestinian negotiating team would have to uh, travel from Ramallah to Tel Aviv because the meetings were taking place in Tel Aviv. And she relays these anecdotes whereby, you know, every time they would go have to drive to Tel Aviv, they would have to cross through Israeli checkpoints and they would be berated and harassed and forced to wait hours in the sun with no water uh, you know just to just to arrive at the negotiation table it's like how do you negotiate with someone who has their foot over your neck but that that was basically the nature of Israel Palestine negotiations from 1993 to the present which is you have someone who you're negotiating with who is all the while taking your land demolishing your homes arresting you, imposing checkpoints on you, humiliating you, killing you every day, seizing your land, you know, cut, st destroying your property. And that's the person you're supposed to be negotiating with? And there's some semblance that these were fair negotiations? Yeah. Um, I, I made a mistake when you were talking about Taba uh, as the chatter is clarifying. Ehud Barak and Arafat weren't at Taba. They were at Camp David in which Barak gave embarrassingly bad offers. And even then, there was uh, concessions made as well. Taba was the best offer uh, until that point, and was to put an end to suddenly was put to an end suddenly as an election was coming up, along with other factors. In parentheses, uh, the team is uh, the teams in a press conference later said that they had been given little a little more time. They would have probably reached an agreement. Annapolis was technically better, but cut short due to courts chasing Olmert. Yeah, I mean. Like I said, it's how, how is it that you're expected to negotiate with a person who has their foot over your neck? I mean, that that's kind of, I think, how you need to, to, to interpret these negotiations, which is that Israel had all the power and Palestinians had no power. And when you're in a position of no power, trying to negotiate with someone who has all the power, and at the same time, the, 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 you know, the framework with, within which these negotiations were taking place, i.e. American diplomats, you know, American uh, <clears throat> uh, sites, Camp David, right? Amer uh, you know, American um, pressure that, you know, basically... There was no semblance that 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 Palestinians were going to get a fair fair deal here, um, because most of the pressure was really being applied on Palestinians from Americans via the Israelis. All the while, for those of you who don't understand the circumstances on the ground, um, the apartheid state is is strengthening its grip around the Palestinians. The occupation is worsening, uh, and and the uh, what Betzelem calls the permanent regime is being enacted. And slowly but surely, freedom of travel is lost in this time frame uh, for Palestinians who used to be able to freely travel from, uh, ostensibly, uh, from the West Bank to Gaza to Israel proper even and work in these areas. And, and um, the situation worsens in, in dramatic ways that they can experience and see and, and is even humiliating in many ways. So I think that this is an important factor to consider when, when discussing it. Uh, especially when you want to understand the, the framework in which uh, 
certain factions of the Palestinian Liberation Fronts uh, branched out into more violent means over over the years. It didn't happen because there was some some interest that like oh they want to forcibly rid all of the Jews uh, through violence the, through Israel uh, and and more so regardless of what charters uh, uh, the, even Hamas had that it uh, its its methods became more and more violent as a response to the horrifying violence that Palestinians were subjected to. And, and, and that kind of violence is often lost on Americans because it's a, it's a legal structure. It's done under the auspices of the state. So uh, we are sometimes subject to it ourselves. You know, black Americans understand it, I think, uh, especially uh, throughout history. But uh, most living in the imperial core have no way to to comprehend this uh, this kind of um, systematic destruction of all civil liberties. We're not talking specifically about like gay rights being taken away or abortion rights uh, being uh, destroyed and crimin the criminalization of abortion at the hands of the Supreme Court. It's like that times a thousand. And that in and of itself is also horrifying too. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that at all. But... Um, in order to try and empathize with this plight, you have to you have to comprehend that this is like every aspect of your life and everything that you've known and your and your uh, and your normal day to day existence is being uh, destroyed systematically by an incredibly militant state that very openly is saying uh, your existence on this land on your ancestral home is contentious. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's continue. Let's finish this off. When Ehud Olmert, the Israeli prime minister, offered the Palestinian all the West Bank and East Jerusalem as their capital, they said no to every offer that was made to them, invested all the money they received from the world in terror, and then cried that they were their victims. Uh, the Palest I mean, <laughs> look, at this point, he's just speaking in such extreme generalities. Like, all the money was used for terror. All It's just like... He's, he's, you don't need to respond to someone who, who, who's, who's sort of speaking with grotesque overgeneralizations. So, I mean, he's just kind of showing his own hand right now. He's showing his true cards, which are, you know, I am deeply anti-Palestinian. I am super racist against Arabs and Muslims more generally. And I have no desire to actually understand what Palestinians were using their money for and what they weren't. Zach, can I say something here, though? Yeah. I think it would be, um, I think it's, I can't believe I'm saying this, but. Given the audience, I think it's still important to not just say that this is racist, but also offer counterexamples because many people receiving this information also have uh, the, the same racist principles, like the implicit biases that were carefully cultivated over the course of the, the war on terror uh, universe that they were born into. So it sounds like a like a stupid thing to say to like counter his racism with facts, but I think it's important to do so. Um, I, I don't know. I, I if you have any uh, if you have anything to say about specifically this aspect, maybe the uh, the uh, the relationship between Hamas and and other uh, secular uh, other secular factions and the and the ongoing conflict uh, uh, between them. Uh, and and how it was not a, a monolith, in spite of the fact that this demon over here is fucking uh, saying like all all Palestinians are Hamas. You know, yeah, I mean, that first of all, first of all, I would say that <clears throat> you know a lot of the money that went that was funneled from uh, Western governments and, and the EU and the United States to the Palestinian Authority was spent on security services. Okay, and this was very much part of the entire concept, which was Israel wanted to outsource. It's occupation and the control, the, the you know the policing of the occupation, right? The, the police who are standing on the streets making sure there aren't protests. Israel wanted to outsource all that to the Palestinian Authority, right? How did they do that? Mo much of the money was spent on guns and weapons, and and security and, and helmets and 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 other you know uh, things that were needed to patrol and police Palestinians. This was basically the, the kind of the, if you really under, try, try, want to understand what, what Oslo was all about, it was Israel saying, how can we offload this issue? How can we offload controlling Palestinians uh, to the Palestinian Authority themselves? Because the whole concept was Israel was always going to maintain total security control of everything. That was, part, that was essentially embedded in the Oslo framework was the, 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 pr the primacy of Israeli security needs. Everything else was 
secondary, right? That was kind of the, if you really had to say what was Oslo, it was how can the Israeli government offload the policing of Palestinian streets? It didn't want to do that because it saw what happened during the first Intifada when Palestinians rose up against the occupation and you know started throwing stones at, sol at soldiers and tanks. And so Israel doesn't, didn't want to be policing the streets anymore. And so it was like, how can, we, how can we basically still maintain control of everything, maintain the occupation, maintain the, the control of the maritime uh, coastland, and maintain control of the Jordan Valley, and then maintain control of the entire borders of all of Israel-Palestine, while at the same time extracting ourselves from those those day-to-day -day kind of violent encounters, um, let let the Palestinian security forces do that, and so I think and so so yeah that that's what a lot of the a majority of the money was spent on that. Yeah, um, this also I think is important to understand in in uh, analyzing contemporary Palestinian existence and like you saw an aspect of this yesterday when uh, the West Bank was not. <laughs> protesting the Israeli occupation, but what they see as an extension of said occupation, which is uh, a boss. Uh, I mean, there is um, the, the Palestinian Authority, as far as I understand it, is quite contentious at this point because it has basically become another imperial vestige, a, a, a part of the Israeli security apparatus, uh, routinely working against uh, the interests of Palestinians as the Israeli government uh, through endless settlement expansions, have partitioned off the West Bank in its entirety and has made uh, uh, Palestinians' lives in the West Bank uh, uh, unimaginably awful. And, and now uh, Palestinians see the PA as, um, as, as a group of individuals who like, give up 14-year-old stone throwers to the, to the IDF when, when asked for it. And that's, that's certainly... Uh, I think that certainly is the Israeli design for the situation uh, in an effort to slowly but surely push people further and further into the hands of more radical fundamentalist Islamist groups like Hamas uh, and, and, um, and portray all Palestinians as Hamas in an effort to, you know, complete the ethnic displacement and, and find the justification from within that, oh, well, all Palestinians are Hamas. They all want... Uh, you know, they, they all want um, the, the old Hamas charter, the 1988 charter. Look at their old charter where they said they want to expel all Jews by force. And uh, in order to maintain the security state, we must do everything in our power to, to purge them violently. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you disagree with anything I said so far? There might be, uh, I might be reductive. No, no, I... I think you're completely right that most Palestinians see the Palestinian Authority as part of Israel's occupation rather than representing some kind of rejection or resistance to it. I mean, this has been the case for a long time now. Just uh, in, was it June, July, when Israel went into the Janine refugee camp and leveled you know, an entire neighborhood, displacing th something like 3,000 Palestinians from Janine. In the, in the aftermath of that uh, uh, heinous attack, um, Palestinians held funerals for the Palestinians who were killed during that attack. And there were a number of uh, senior PA officials that showed up to the funeral. They were booed. They were forced out. They were kicked out of the funeral procession. Yeah. Because there was no desire. There was no interest in having these PA officials who themselves allowed the Israeli forces to enter Janin in the first place. Remember, Janin is ostensibly under the control of the Palestinian Authority. You know, yeah. every, every most, most of the major pa Palestinian population centers in the West Bank, Ramallah, Beit Lahem, you know, Nablus, Janine, Hebron, uh, Khalil, they're all under Palestinian authorities' ostensible control. And yet, Israeli military uh, uh, raids go into those areas on a near daily basis, all with the consent and approval of the Palestinian Authority. And yeah. so, to pretend like the Palestinian Authority are somehow, you know, defending the Palestinians is absolutely insane and 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 that's and that's why by the way you just saw earlier was it yesterday or today masses of protests uh, in in the streets of ramallah and elsewhere in the west bank protesting obviously not just israel but also protesting the palestinian authority yes exactly uh, and and once again i want to reinforce this that was deliberate that was by design that is precisely why in a, in a closed door meeting in 2019 to Likud members benjamin netanyahu purposely said uh, we control how high the flames go uh the the uh, anyone that wants to thwart 
the nation state development project of Palestinians must treat Hamas as the single force in the room uh, that that the the I think ritualistic humiliation of the Palestinian Authority uh, is is a part of that design that uh, you know you only negotiate with Hamas you make Hamas to be the only uh, force for Palestinians this way internally you get to uh, justify all of the atrocities uh, in the in the interest of security because you're the security candidate and you're Netanyahu uh, you know we have to we have to consistently squeeze the Palestinians uh, over and over again and uh, and I think that that is by design like I said it's a it's a two front war uh, destroy the it neuter the Palestinian Authority use them as your own uh, use them as your own as a part of your security apparatus and then only reinforce uh, the power that Hamas has by dealing with them exclusively, sometimes through violent means and other times through even like uh, allowing funds to go to the uh, to Hamas as the singular force in the in the Gaza Strip. So I feel like that is the reason why uh, we're in the position that we're in now. And and that was actually well reflected by by uh, not just like Gideon Levi, but many other Israeli thinkers, even the entirety of the opinion, editorial opinion, uh, a board of, of Haaretz, right? I mean, they this is precisely what they were saying when they said October 7th is entirely in the hands of of uh, a, a, a security candidate that claimed that he could keep Israelis safe and secure and failed on that promise because uh they kept pushing and pushing and pushing and being more and more violent. Um, this is why it was called the Al-Aqsa flood. Not, like, this is not a justification for the atrocities in any capacity, but there's a reason why the operation was called the Al-Aqsa flood. It was supposed to be a response to uh, the, the violence that Palestinians are subjected to right there. Right? Yeah, look, you don't need, you don't need to trust Haaretz or Gideon Levy. You can just look to the statements of Israel's right wing leaders themselves. Betzal Smotrich, who's currently the finance minister, said, I believe it was in 2015 already. So we're we're going back eight years. He said, Hamas is an asset. Well, the Palestinian Authority is a liability. Why is that? Because the it, it, because the Palestinian Authority is the people you have to deal with to create a Palestinian state. But if you, <clears throat> but if you empower Hamas, then you don't have to worry about ever having ever having to give up any, uh, um, you know, land or ever having to give up a Palestinian state because the entire wor world rejects Hamas, um, and so that's a non-issue. Um, so basically, number one, Hamas is the asset because you have the right wing doesn't want to create a Palestinian state. Number two, Hamas is strengthened and is allowed to exist and persist and even even strengthen itself. Um, so that Palestinians remain divided. And this has long been a tactic of Israel to drive a wedge between different Palestinian factions. They, that was the entire reason why they funded and supported Hamas in the early 1980s was to drive a wedge uh, and try and undermine the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, the, their, their main adversary at the time. Yeah. And so this has been a long-standing Israeli tactic, which is to divide and conquer. It's a colonial strategy, by the way, no surprise, but um, you're 100% correct. Yeah, it's a colonial strategy and also one that America readily applies uh, everywhere, whether it be Latin America or, or wherever we have imperial interests. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not shocking that Israel uh, does the same thing. Um, okay, well, let's, um, let's, uh, let's get back to this part. I'm glad that we parsed through this, I think, because like, these, the, these are very common talking points. And I, I and I feel like it's important to address the lies baked into that because this is like pretty basic, uh, like the way that I think Israeli history is taught in America and and I suspect in Israel as well is is quite similar to what he's presenting uh, this as, and I feel like it's very one sided and also uh, a historical does not feature the the uh, real conditions in which Palestinians were uh, were living under the occupation. Um, and conditions that were horrible uh, and and were reported on quite frequently. That is precisely the reason why I, was it? I think it was Desmond Tutu, or it might have been Nelson Mandela. I mean Nelson Mandela, who personally said that the apartheid was happening in Israel um, uh, at the exact same time that it was happening in in South Africa, and that that condition has only worsened for the Palestinians in that time frame. 
whereas the, the apartheid has ended in South Africa. Offered the Palestinians all the West Bank and East Jerusalem as their capital. They said no to every offer that was made to them, invested all the money they received from the world in terror, and then cried that <laughs> they were their victims. The Palestinians do have a harder life than we Israelis, but they only have themselves to blame. So what is the solution? <laughs> There's always like a, like little kids doing Halloween, but this harder time they're fucking... Israelis, but they only have themselves. Like, this is such a funny... Like... <gasps> I mean, listen. What is that supposed to be a photo of? Yeah, and he's just saying like they they. This is what Palestinians have to blame. Like this is why they they're like this because this. It's like okay, like they therein lies. Here's the thing. Therein lies the the difference the uh, between having a developed nation state that is like funded by the Western world versus being. Uh, like having a government that uh, has been declared a terror cell uh, and is designed as a as a terrorist, um, where yeah, you you wear your colors like ultimately you're you're a terrorist, you're a little terrorist. Look at these little terrorists that are like born and bred to hate uh, Israel and be anti-Semitic and blah blah blah. Whereas like no such th this is what what I mean when I when I say there's always a double standard where like no such. Uh, assertions would ever be made if you see like little kids in Israel proper saying like they want to become IDF one day so they can, you know, so they can defend Israel. When from his point of existence, from his framework, like that's kind of what he's doing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. This is, again, a very weird and, and uh, gross way to portray the entirety of the uh, uh, Palestinians as like uh, people who are also uh under the uh under the banner of terrorism under the banner of hamas like look at these little kids are also like that it's like a cultural problem look at this cultural identity problem that they have to blame so what is the solution when will there be peace not in the near future because this conflict is not about the land i've already told you that even uh -huh. before the 60 yeah i mean if he puts more fucking photos of little kids i'm gonna lose my goddamn mind this is so insane <laughs> <laughs> like what serves what, what purpose does it serve other than to say like palestinians are little fucking demons even as, as a child look at them like they're playing with rpg toys and shit not understanding that like these are the conditions that you have subjected fucking children to that all they know all they know is an endless amount of fucking violence that that uh, that they see or they've been taught is like uh, the the only emancipatory mechanism out of that is by fucking putting on a goddamn rocket propelled grenade over your shoulder it's like when you grow up in gaza or the west bank and you're subjected to daily harassment daily checkpoints daily home demolitions daily land confiscations by israelis carrying guns driving in ar driving in tanks rolling through your towns and streets with their with their armored vehicles and their machine guns it's like what the hell did you think would happen yeah ridiculous oh ridiculous and the way to stop this is by going in the exact opposite direction by the way like there's no way to stop this there's no way to stop uh, the the violence of the israeli uh, apartheid regime there's no way to stop it until israel decides to stop it right and, and the moment that Israel stops that violence is the moment where you starve out uh, more radical components, more radical factions. The only reason why their influence has grown over the years is because Israel's provided no solutions out of this other than violent, uh, you know, other than a violent retaliation. What happens? Well, and even before 1948, the Palestinians were trying to wipe out the Jews. Here is another example. Take Gaza. In 2005, Israeli by the way, the just that one, just a quick point there. For decades before 1948, um, Zionists were debating how exactly they were going to establish a state in a land that was majority Arab Palestinian. How would you, how how do you establish a Jewish state in a land that's mostly Arab Palestinian? In fact, you know what? And and so they debated it. Some people were like, "Well, maybe we can convince the Palestinians to leave voluntarily," and then others were like, "You know what? They're probably not going to leave voluntarily. We're probably going to have to expel them." And that was the debate that Zionists were having in the late 30s and 1940s. And so his point that's, is literally you could you, you could really just flip Jews and Palestinians in this sentence right here that Palestinians were trying to wipe out the Jews. If you flipped it and said Jews were debating how to wipe out Palestinians, that would be much more accurate. Yeah. Um it's uh oh god, I don't 
I, I think there's so much projection in in every in every ounce of like uh, in, in in every single aspect of, of of Zionist propaganda that like that's why I, that's why I would say it's like you have to maintain a genocidal slow ethnic cleansing apartheid structure in order to stop some hypothetical uh, Islamist fundamentalist genocide from occurring down the line and it's like that's not that's no way to exist. That there, that's no way to exist. Like this is, that that, that is at the heart uh, of the problem. Is that uh, it, it requires a tremendous no, uh, amount of violence for its maintenance, and and it, I think it creates like delusional, a uh, paranoid, uh, like a delusional paranoid collective psyche, uh, because everyone feels like whether they recognize it or not, collectively responsible for the violence. Um, it's it's really, really sad. Chomsky says calling it an apartheid is charitable to Israel. Yes, but it's, I mean, apartheid is it? I'm old enough, even myself, at the age of 32, I'm old enough to remember a time when it was completely uh, unacceptable to call Israel an apartheid state. Uh, that that change has happened uh, quite recently, a couple of years back, actually, I think when Amnesty International and, and the Human Rights Watch openly decided to call the apartheid regime an apartheid. So... That's and and that was combated every, uh, every step of the way, uh, tooth and nail. So, uh, and even then, even now, you see fucking you know Amy Schumer post about how uh, Israel is not an apartheid state because it has twenty percent uh, uh, Palestinians living in Israel proper, and it's actually a democracy. But what about the fucking five million Palestinians that live under occupation? Oh well, they're not even mentioned in the process. Anyway, that's sad. Jews. Here is another example. Take Gaza. In 2005, Israeli withdrew from the Gaza Strip. Gaza is an Israeli and Jew-free area. The Palestinians huh. get more money than I mean, any other group on the planet. This is such a, this is one of the most insidious of all the lies. Yeah. Israel withdrew and we, Israel no longer controls Gaza. I mean, okay, well, let's see. Um, Israel controls six of the seven land borders and colludes with uh, Egypt to control the seventh. Israel controls the coastline, Israel controls the airspace, the groundwater, the telecommunication networks, and thus internet access via those telecommunication networks. It also controls all the electricity that goes into Gaza, and it controls the population registry. So to pretend like Israel doesn't control Gaza is, is just to, I don't know, like, it's like, what kind of fantasy world are you living in? If Israel doesn't control Gaza, then why don't they just leave? Why don't they just get on a boat and leave? Yeah, why can't why can't Gazans uh yeah, why can't Gazans fish beyond like the six mile coastline that was designated for them? Or um why can't Palestinians have an airport? There was an airport there in two thousand one, right? I mean in two thousand there was an airport there. What happened to the Palestinian airport? Why can't they rebuild it? Now the answer, depending on what seasoning of of uh, ultra Zionists you're talking to will will range from well it's a security concern to because they're inferior and and therefore they don't like to build and they only use all the concrete for tunnels and and uh, you know throwing bombs into Israel so you know but the real obviously the real answer is because Israel bombed it and then they refused to allow uh, Palestinians to rebuild it that's the real answer. That is 100% correct. Yeah. <laughs> because they did 9-11. That's why they don't have an airport, said Michael Vick's cat. I mean, he's joking, by the way. He's not being serious. Yeah. Oh, my God. Thank God America wasn't like... I mean, they fucking invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. Might as well. Holy shit. <laughs> they could have they been like, Palestine is next. Planet from the U.S., from the European Union, from Arab countries, from the U.N., and what do they do with this money? Infrastructure, education? No, they build tunnels and buy weapons to kill Jews. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I love this. I love this argument. It's so, it's so psychotic. And it also literally is like, it's a reinforcement of, ex I am reminded originally of the time when this person said, he does not like Benjamin Netanyahu, and he posted a photo in the beginning. I don't know if you remember, where he's like, Itamar ben Gavir and Benjamin Netanyahu, I disagree with them. What does he disagree with them on? Because this is like straight, hyper right-wing, ultra-nationalist, ultra-Zionist propaganda. What, what do you disagree with them on? You don't disagree with them on the practice of like 
uh, of like saying all Palestinians are fucking Hamas and that all Hamas is doing is like taking the money from the international community and like building AK 47s. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's, so what is it? Well, what's, where is the difference in agreement there? I don't get it. Um, but yeah, the idea that like they're taking all of the aid and, and, uh, using it on weapons is, is really, really fucked up and, and really frustrating. Uh, I mean, we just raised uh, $1 million uh, uh, for, for four uh, Palestinian uh, organizations that are working on the ground. This community, we're at $1 million, um, $1 million, uh, $18,000 so far. Um, and, and if you look at the internet, if you look at what people are saying online about it, it is fucking insane, especially on Reddit. Everyone's like, oh, that's not going to the Palestinian... Uh, uh, Red Crescent Society or or the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. These are all these are not organizations that are vetted and have to work with the Israeli government at all. These are actually uh, you know Hamas funded uh, cutouts. These are not going to like save uh, children in Gaza that are uh, currently being ruthlessly slaughtered under Israeli rocket fire. This is like giving uh, giving Gazans more more rockets. It's disgusting. It's dehumanizing. And uh, unfortunately, it's a relatively successful propaganda that uh, portrays all Arabs as like, uh, you know, non-human monsters that are simply just violently retaliating for no reason because they're barbaric. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a do you have a, a take on the, the they use all the money? I feel like I'm talking way too much. I need to shut the fuck up. You're my guest. You're way more knowledgeable on this stuff. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I think you should uh, say some stuff here about uh, at least like uh, where uh, funds have been utilized historically. I mean, look, for a long time, funnels were used to import and export to, to build an economy, right? Because Israel imposed a 16-year blockade and siege on Gaza that prevented things need, needed to live a basic human life, like cement, to rebuild all the buildings that were bombed. You know, it got, uh, Hamas built tunnels connecting the Egyptian side of Rafah to the Palestinian side of Rafah in order to be able to import and export everything, right? This was part of, you know, f f having, being able to build a, a normal economy. So, you know, it's just sort of trying to put things in context here. It's like... In addition, I would say, you know how much Israel spends on its military, you know? And by the way, the United States contributes to that. We, the United States gives Israel $4 billion in military aid every year. Why doesn't it, so it's like, well, you're going to criticize Hamas for, you know, uh, buying, you know, getting weapons, but what about Israel? It's like, well, Palestinians kill Israelis, and Israelis kill 100 times as many Palestinians. You're not criticizing the weapons Israel gets and only the weapons uh, that, that Hamas gets? It's just a double standard. Yeah, because, well, because you slap the terrorist designation on it and there's no, like, ministry. That's why you can very easily just say, like, uh, that's why you hear it all the time when people just go, like, well, it's the Hamas uh, health ministry that said this or it's the, it's the Hamas this that is trying to engage in trade. And it's like, well, then all matter of trade that Palestinians are supposed to be doing in Gaza is just all terrorism. That is by design. That is the, the purpose uh, of, of propping up Hamas and then, and, and then saying, like, this is a violent terrorist organization uh, that does uh, brutal things. And, and there is some truth to that, obviously. There is a, there is a, a, a lot of violence that, uh, that occurred. But that, even, even in, that is always left out in the dark without any sort of historical framework and and uh mentioned without offering any alternatives or or uh a time when there were alternatives to that uh so it's um it's very frustrating uh every every state is is operated by their military technically that's why republicans say uh or conservatives in america say like taxation is theft and it's like stolen it's stolen from you at gunpoint because the state has a monopoly on violence. You know, you can make that argument for every fucking nation state. Yeah. Muhammad al Kurd had a nice video where he illustrated how, how everything in Gaza is labeled like Hamas run health minister, Hamas run hospital, Hamas run education, you know, Hamas run blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, 
it's like there's a very specific reason why media outlets are doing that, right? It's and it, it's like trying to brand everyone and everything and everybody in 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 Gaza as a terrorist. Yeah, and it's like incredibly dehumanizing. Like you know, like like doctors are terrorists. You know, school teachers are terrorists. It's it's disgusting. Well, it served the purpose of like justifying their death and destruction in the hands of the Israeli state. They're all terrorists, so they're all human shields. They're all terrorists, and they're, they're not real humans. So when these children die, 1,000 of them are in the last siege so far, it's considered to be appropriate. That way, it is uh, much easier to... It's much easier to believe the propaganda that like, well, these guys are human shields. You know, these children were human shields or that was a sacrifice that we could make and it was justifiable violence. Why do they do that? The Hamas constitution makes it very clear. The first sentence is Israel will exist until Islam wipes it out. It doesn't say we want peace. It doesn't say we want a Palestinian. Yeah, no, as opposed to like uh, the the. <laughs> The, the origination of the Israeli nation state, which was always very peaceful, where, where the Israelis were like, here, we'll kiss you guys out of the villages that you will leave voluntarily. Because you're like, oh, stop tickling me. You're tickling me too much. Um, but, uh, but again, yeah. that, old, that is the 1988 Hamas charter. Hamas at the time was like a fucking marginal, marginal group that you also have mentioned was, uh, was... You explain it. Sorry, fuck, what am I doing? Go ahead, please address these takes. I'm done. I'm done. No, no, you're, you're only you from now on. Fuck. Please, no, you're you're killing it. Please continue. Look, uh, the only thing I would add is that you know, obviously, Hamas started as an Islamic charity it, before the the Charter of of August 1988. <clears throat> in the first, the, the Intifada broke out in '87, right? And in the, in late '87, in, in that first year after the Intifada, um, Israeli uh, military forces killed 142 people in the Gaza Strip, all the while suffering a grand total of zero casualties. And this inflamed Hama, inflamed the Islamic charity, the Mujama, uh, and inflamed the Mujama al Islamiya is what was, what was called before 88. It, the, you know, and they were inflamed and enraged and radicalized as a result of the grotesque Israeli violence. So that's, that's the first point I would make. Secondly, Already before August 88, you have multiple proposals from Hamas, leading Hamas officials, including Sheikh Ahmed Yassin himself, as well as another guy, um, another senior official, basically putting forward kind of peace feelers to Israel at the time that were obviously completely rejected outright. And, and the, because those peace officers involved Palestinian self-determination, a withdrawal from the uh, occupied territories, and a return of the refugees, all of which are total non-starters for the state of Israel, which is hell-bent on preserving its Jewish majority at, at all costs, no matter how much violence Israelis will face, they will, they will, they would rather have many thousands of Israelis massacred than let back in Palestinian refugees or give up control of Palestinian land. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the first point I would make. And then, you know, by by, by the two thousands, by two thousand six, you have another proposal by Esmel Hania, who publishes a piece, I believe, in the Guardian, basically saying, "Look, we're open to to peace with Israel." Same thing happens in two thousand eight with Khaled Mashal, publishes another uh, op-ed, I believe, in the Guardian, basically saying, "Look, we're open to a ten year truce." And then in twenty twelve, you have uh, the second uh, command in, in uh, the second um, mil military commander in the Hamas um, uh, military wing. Um, Ahmed Jabari, I believe was his name, who just a few hours before being assassinated by Israel had received a peace deal, had received the draft of a peace deal that, that was the result of months-long negotiation process between backdoor channels between Hamas and the state of Israel that was received the full support and approval of then uh, Defense Minister Ehud Barak. A few hours after Ahmed Jabari received the peace proposal, he was assassinated along with six other Palestinians. Because Israel had no interest in a peace deal with Hamas at that point. Israel wanted to strengthen its deterrent, deterrence capacity and, and destroy as many Hamas leaders as it could. Israel want, chose war over peace. And so, and then, and, and, and basically I would say that's kind of been the status quo for um, almost a decade now, which is that Israel is more or less happy to have Hamas on its southwestern flank because it means that it doesn't have to negotiate with the Palestinians. Because look, they're divided. Look, they, they, all they want to do is, is send rockets at us. All they, they're t all terrorists. And this gave Israel the plausible deniability it needed to claim that it was the Palestinians that rejected peace, not the Israelis. So again, there's a lot of 
you know, I mean, kind of selectively choosing facts here in this narrative, and this is just a classic example of it. Yeah. State. It clearly says until Islam wipes it out, they want a Muslim caliphate. I respect Hamas for wanting only, for actually expressing and being clear about what they want. <laughs> yeah, except he's like, I respect Hamas for saying this so I can use it to say that all Palestinians love Hamas and also Hamas wants to ethnically cleanse all Jews from Israel. I respect them for saying that because it makes propagandizing against Palestinians much easier, which is literally identical to Benjamin Netanyahu's perspective and, and his design for uh, how to thwart a Palestinian nation state being developed, which is, you know, even funnier when he says, this is the Israeli perspective you've never heard. I've heard this perspective. I've only heard this perspective. I've never heard another perspective. This was not a unique one at all. Sorry. Which is to eliminate Israel. Personally, I want the Palestinians to have a democratic state with human rights and freedoms. And I wish for all Arabs <laughs> and Muslims to, to have the same. But what I want is not necessarily what they want. To solve the problem, you need to understand the problem. And the problem... This guy's a good understander of the problem. I, I, I feel... I'm feeling like he totally has a good grasp on the situation after what he just said. ...is made up of two things. One which Westerners don't understand anymore, religion. And one which Westerners don't want to talk about, what? values. Religion plays no role at all in European politics. What? <laughs> I think honestly, like the last six minutes of this video is like him just spewing anti Muslim and anti Arab hate and just sort of demonizing all Muslims all around the world. And, 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 and it's, it's pretty wild, honestly. Like he should have just stopped the video here because the last six minutes are just like not helping his cause. No, I love this. I, I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, <laughs> a guy who won said Hamas is a certain way. And then immediately speaks like the cartoonish depiction of how like all Palestinians are in his eyes, but with a role reversal. It's always so funny when people are like, yeah, these guys are like Islamist fundamentalists that want to wipe out everybody. And then they turn and, and, and you know, think that like uh, all Jewish people are demons or whatever. And then immediately turn around and start talking about all Arabs as like pests that must be expelled forcibly because they're ruining like the beautiful European culture or whatever the fuck. Uh, you know, and, and it just simply cannot coexist in, in beautiful white Europe uh, with, their, with their rape gangs or whatever the fuck they say. It's just so frustrating. In the U.S., politicians do say God bless America, and the debate surrounding abortion is partly religious. But when it comes to foreign policies, you don't hear American generals talk about spreading the word of, of, of Jesus. That's literally objectively false. George W. Bush said God told him to invade Iraq. There were plenty of generals at the time who talked about how this was the holy crusade. Plenty of soldiers also love Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and, and you know, were bearing the cross when they were in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is completely and objectively and utterly false. The only difference is that because it's Christian, it's the dominant ethnic, uh, ethno-religious group that nobody actually sees that as like an aberration or weird or gross. Or religious having said that none of these things are actually religious uh none of these conflicts are actually born out of religion it's just a, a material interest in grabbing as much land as possible or an extraction of natural resources it's just religion is the seasoning that you add to it and and sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't oh my god i'm doing the same thing again sorry zach go ahead no, I was just going to say, uh, Hassan, I have to actually confess something, which is that I didn't realize you were Turkish. Sen Türk olduğunu hiç bilmedim ya. Oh, wow, you speak Turkish? <laughs> That's crazy. I, Wait, what I, did you I think do, I was? Yeah. My name is Hassan. What? Yo, I honestly didn't know. I wasn't, I apologize. I didn't do my homework before this chat. No, um, you were like, damn, this white boy's spitting. Why does he care about Palestinians so much? What the fuck? <laughs> is that what you yeah, thought? I, I figured... Yeah. <laughs> No, I thought you were Arab, actually. I didn't realize you were Turkish. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I am. Don't worry, that's what the Turks... My... In, don't worry, that's what the fucking Turks in my chat have been saying the, these past couple of days as well, that I'm, that I'm Arab and not Turkish anymore because I defend uh, Palestinians. I mean, <clears throat> we didn't even talk about Mavi Marmara. You know, I feel like we should I, have brought I have. that up at some point. I did. Okay. Uh, I, I brought it up uh, in a Turkish rant when I was yelling at the Turks saying that, like... Some of you think you are more supreme than Arabs and think you're Western backed and, and think that the West uh, sees you as anything different. But, uh, you know, Israel could do a hundred Mavi Marmaras and the Western world would not turn a, a, you know, the Western world would turn a blind eye to it. They got really mad at me. 
Yeah, anyway, sorry, sorry for distracting us from the video. I just I did not realize that, and so I wanted to uh, share some Turkish love with you. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, all right, let's continue with this race. In the Muslim rant. world, it is very different. When Arabs kill Jews at a music festival, or Christians in a school in Nigeria, or one another in Syria, Yemen, Libya, what is it they shout? Allah Akbar, God is great. Oh Jihad my is God! A religious okay. war against the infidels. To many Europeans, the words infidels and her dude, he's so good. He's spitting. I've never heard this one before. That's crazy. The the unified, uh, the unified uh, uh, Islamic uh, jihadists across the board. Wow, this is some this is some post nine eleven shit right here. This is like I feel like a two thousand two. You know, good stuff. Yeah, this is very reminiscent of the anti Muslim bigotry that was so pervasive in the aftermath of nine eleven. Yeah, this is like some of our some of our more important thinkers, like uh, <laughs> uh, Sam Harris, uh, uh, channeled uh, this this intellectual school of thought. It's it's great. Yeah, this is like a incredibly reductive Reddit atheism analysis. But of course, I don't expect that from the likes of Sam Harris, who fancies uh, himself to be an intellectual. I do expect that from some fucking random guy who has a traveling to Israel dot com blog on YouTube. So it's a little bit different when you hear it from someone who who is uh, supposedly a part of the intelligentsia. Heresy probably remind them of dark days that played out hundreds of years ago when Catholics and Protestants were killing each other. Sadly, this is still the situation in some parts of the Muslim world. Just think about the organizations you hear about in the Muslim world: Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, the Taliban, these aren't national organizations. They are all religious organizations. Now let's talk about the bigger issue, values. Lots of people run from... Wow. Uh, yeah, let's, let's move past that one. He's like, all Muslims, all Muslims are run under uh, Islamist fundamentalist groups that the Western world has placed upon damn near the entirety of the fucking world under, uh, under the auspices of defeating uh, Cold War... Uh, defeating uh, the the socialist influence of the Cold War, like uh, it's great. I love that. It's uh, it's it's because uh, everyone was volunteering that they were like, I love, uh, I, I love being ruled by the Taliban. That's that's is the. It's so stupid. I'm sorry. Do you have anything mm. to say about this? I mean, this is like moving beyond uh, Palestine at this point. It's just like straight up being fucking a psychotic freak. But I love that he said he, yeah, he likes facts though. Facts. <laughs> Well, look, I think when thinking about religious violence, I would say that you really do need to take a bird's eye view here because otherwise you're <clears throat> what you're actually doing is you're trying to understand political and social and economic history rather than religious rather than religions and religious history. And when you kind of zoom out but take a bird's eye view, you know, Christians have been some of the most violent and some of the most, you know, have used Christianity in the name of violence as much as anyone else historically. And so, you know, I, I don't understand why all of, an, all of a sudden he's sort of like going to pretend like ancient history doesn't matter anymore when thinking about like what religions are violent and what religions are peaceful. But like, you know, he's not really interested in understanding violence and, and peace and what religions have to say about them. He's just looking to demonize Muslims and brand Hamas as an, you know, an extremist religious organization that is indis indistinguishable from all these others. And it's just part of this bigger problem, which is Islam. And that's his real aim here. Yeah, which is ironic because, like, obviously it is anti-Semitic to claim that uh, Zionism is inherently in the interest of all Jews all around the world. And and I will always make that distinction that, like, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism and Jews are not a monolith and it's fucking ridiculous to claim uh, such a thing. Uh, and yet, like, I feel like he gave so much religious context originally or at least utilize religion originally to talk about how important like Israel is and has to be developed. And in that same breath, of course, omits key details and like the endless amount of violence that was done to justify a, a Jewish nation state, to erect a Jewish nation state, uh, not realizing that like from that same reductive lens, that is ironic that you're saying that like, oh no, we have a Jewish theocracy uh, that we are interested in developing, interested in building, and that the building of said um, uh, theocratic apartheid structure, of course, is like incredibly violent 
and forcibly expels everyone that is is considered uh, to not be a part of the in group, and then and and he ties it back to religion in the same way. In in many ways, like that from a reductive lens, it's identical, but just with a role reversal. And one is an established nation state, so you understand that that's like appropriate, and the other is not. It's a militant group. And I'm doing it again. Yeah. Look, I think. I think most historians, if not pretty much all historians uh, of Israel-Palestine, agree that the issue is land. It's not religion. And I think the problem with this entire video is that he's obsessed with religion and wants to place religion at the center of the conflict. But guess what? Long before there was Hamas, long before there was Islamic Jihad, there was a fight over the land. And that fight over the land will continue long after... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Palestinians decide th there are better ways of, of trying to reconquer that land than embracing kind of fundamentalist Islam. So again, like uh, he, he's, it really just it really to me highlights his misunderstanding of the fundamental issue at the, on the table here, which is that you have two people. One came from outside of Palestine and wanted to control Palestine. One was already living in Palestine and is defending Palestine from that conquest and from that invasion and from that occupation and from that siege. And that's the fundamental issue. And religion is exploited by both sides. It's used by both sides, but it's not the main issue. It's, it's, it's a tool. It's a, it's, it's, it's a weapon that is used. Um, to, <clears throat> that, that's kind of how I would interpret things. And I think, by the way, the overwhelming majority of serious historians would agree with me. Yeah. From this, as if they were running from fire, because the biggest concern is potentially being called a racist. I want to be 100% clear here, although I know that some will do their best to misunderstand me. If I say that men are more violent than women, does it mean I hate all men? No. Does it mean that I think all men are violent? No. Does it mean that there are no violent women? Oh God, I know where this is going. He's going to be Islamophobic, but in a woke way. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, when I say men are more violent than women, I mean statistically. So when I say Muslims are more violent than uh, Christians in Europe, I mean statistically. He's like, dude, that's so sick. I mean, I mean, it, the the Israeli government has is, is, uh, basically invented pinkwashing and and greenwashing uh, an apartheid uh, structure. So like, it's cool that he is continuing on with this tradition by 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 finding by doing 1350 style uh, racist agitprop, but in a woke way. Like, you know, just like how men uh, dominate women in a patriarchal uh, structure, uh, Muslims are, are dominating uh, Europeans in an Islamic caliphate that has been established in Europe. <laughs> yeah. No, but if That's in almost great, all countries, more than 90% of those in chairs are men, then you can say that men are more violent than women. I believe you can criticize anyone for anything. You can criticize me as a Jew, as an Israeli, as a man, as a tour guide. You can criticize me for things I can't change. He's a like tour my guide? And for the things I chose. Oh, like fuck. My profession. <laughs> when, I, when I was looking at his YouTube channel, it's like he's going around and like, you know, taking you on a tour of Jerusalem or, or Tel Aviv <laughs> or whatever else. So I think that's what he, that's his whole jam. He's like, here's where the primitive uh, Arab dogs used to live. <laughs> who, we, who we forcibly expelled, thank God. <laughs> what the fuck? What is he talking about? What, what kind of tours is he giving? Oh, God, I, don't, I actually kind of want to know. Music I like. He's, like. he's like, here's the extra racist tour of Israel. <laughs> the fact that I'm a father, my identity is comprised of thousands of different aspects, and you can criticize any one of them. And I can agree or disagree. I can say, true, Israelis aren't very polite and they don't know how to form a queue, but I'm different. And I can also <laughs> accept that criticism. If you are not a narcissist, you know that you're not perfect. I don't subscribe to the narrative that you are only allowed to say good things about other groups and criticize your own. I actually want to be criticized. I want to be made to think, to be made to improve my ways. The Me Too movement. I really do hope maybe he'll see uh, this video that we that that will inevitably come out of this where we like parse through all the things that he said and maybe he'll just come out as like a rugged anti-Zionist. He's like I started reading Elon you know, Pape, I I I started reading Finkelstein. I'm you know <laughs> I had no idea what was well, going on. <laughs> I it, so I'm just scrolling through his YouTube channel and it's it's not just like very like apolitical travel guides to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. It's also like political content. Like he, he has produced plenty of political content before. So I, this is nothing. He's not new to politics. Yeah. I kind of want to see his um, tours. Movement made me rethink the way I interact with women and made me more aware of the language I use. 
I criticize all groups, Americans, Germans, Britney Spears fans, ultra-Orthodox Jews, women, Gen Z, and Muslims. I even criticize the most dangerous group of all, Israeli mothers. If a teacher writes that she is sick, there is no need for 30 get well soon messages. You don't show that you care by writing a message. You're just spamming my WhatsApp. If there were peace in all of the Middle East and only the Arab Muslim Palestinians What? were resorting to violence, I would say, okay, maybe we are in the wrong. But if the Palestinians were using violence before 1967 and before 1948, and almost all of the Arab Muslim countries are dictatorships with high levels of violence and here's low where, levels of this human rights, was, then maybe there's... comment about how he's dehumanizing and he's being incredibly bigoted towards Muslims. I mean, this is exactly what I was talking about. Basically, you know, if you just go back like five, ten seconds, like he just makes this point that basically, look, there's nothing we can do because Muslims are just violent and that's the problem. Yeah, no, this is this is identical to the argument that like uh, black people are in fear. This is what white supremacists say about black people. And then they point to like Africa without any consideration of like the violence of, of uh, colonization and imperialism uh, and and the the theft of natural resources to just kind of say like, look at the look at the structure. It's it's really fucked up. Must be. Must have something to do with uh, how black people are. And that's just like an insanely racist thing to say. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's what he's doing. But this is a little bit more permissible because it's uh, against Arabs and Muslims. And, and that, is, um, that has been long, the, uh, for a very long time, the justification for uh, post 9-11, uh, you know, expansion in the Middle East. And and obviously the the reaction to said expansion. So, yeah. he's a teacher, well, I, dude. He taught me a lot. He taught me new ways of being racist. Yeah, as as Parenti says, Africa is not underdeveloped; it's overexploited. Yes. Um. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, all matter of Arab nations that uh, he's pointing to uh, and and claiming are like Islamist fundamentalists are the way that they are due to. Uh, external factors they're the they are um under reactionary rule for the most part because of the circumstances of their development because of the because of western uh influence in their development uh, in a way that is not dissimilar to hamas uh, growing in influence both as a byproduct of the violent conditions that people were subjected to by a colonial power but also by directly funding and facilitating its growth the said western powers uh, directly funding and facilitating its growth in every single uh structure right uh, yeah <laughs> i'm sorry it's really I, a I problem like here i've kept you here for I like three fucking hours and all i've done is just like yeah i'm sorry i'm so <laughs> no um, you're you should not be apologizing for anything come on don't this, be silly. this is this is what i do every day for 10 hours so i but i they already hear they already hear me all the time I'm, i have to pee you can you can keep going uh, on this I'm also video. getting comments yeah. from Muslims let it roll, let it roll. and Let's... the Americans for all the problems in the Muslim world. And it is true that the creation of many countries and borders in Africa and Asia were determined by the interest of the European empires and that the U.S. think primarily about its own interest. But I'm always shocked to find that Muslims take no responsibility for their wrongdoing. The fact that most of the Muslim countries aren't democratic has nothing to do with the U.S. The fact that 17 of the 20 most dangerous countries for the LGBTQ community are Muslims has nothing to do with colonialism. The fact that almost all of the most dangerous places in the world to be Christians are Muslim has nothing to do with imperialism. The Muslim world is huge. It has a lot of oil and its failure has very little to do with colonialism. Look at the Jews. One third of them were murdered by the Nazis. Israel has no oil and it is surrounded by enemies and yet we are successful. And it's not because of American money. Most of that money has to be used to buy military equipment from American companies. And besides, the Palestinians get way more money. We are successful because we are open-minded, think outside the box, By the way, that's, in education. Israel gets way more violent. money than the Palestinians. This is that's true just a outside the Middle East too. Look Israel at Arab Muslim communities in Europe. The Palestinians If there were violent riots in Paris or Sweden, <clears throat> Rotterdam or billion, London. Maybe 800 million, which is now in the process of being taken away from them. So that he, there was a lie that was repeated there, but... Fucking idiot. Wait, what? What was it? I'm sorry, I I missed it. It I, was just I, one. It was just one insidious lie that he says the Palestinians get way more money <clears throat> than the um in Israel, which is just a straight up lie. Which is that the United States provides Israel in just the fast fiscal year 3.8 billion 
the Palestinians get way less than that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't recall the exact amount. We can look it up, but it's, it's way less than that. Okay. But he's Would almost done. I mean, he, at this point, he's just... <clears throat> yeah, he's just, he's just uh, adding a couple. I, I really do appreciate it because, like, at the end of it, he just kind of really betrays the facts-based uh, analysis that he was he was supposedly offering where he, like, omits key details and obviously tries to to repeat, like, propaganda, make it make this position seem way more agreeable. And then the last, like, the last six minutes of it, as you said, is just straight, like... And, you know, those Arab Muslims are fucking barbaric, brutal, racist, that uh, want to kill everybody and, and throw gays off roofs, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, just, it, it's just, yeah, go ahead. Um, and, and also, yes, we, Arabs get more money than Israel, which is uh, a lie. Okay. In the Jewish neighborhoods or the Arab neighborhoods. This will only come when the Arab change their values, when Muslim countries become <laughs> democratic, when all of the different groups in Syria stop. Yeah, like, like Israel. Democratic like Israel. An apartheid state. Killing one another. When Iranian women are free to cover or not cover their hair. When gay men are not thrown from rooftops in Gaza. Oh, he said it. Oh my God. He said it. He did the ISIS line. He said gay men are thrown off of rooftops in Gaza. Oh God, oh, he's God. so what a fucking gross little pervert gremlin he is for that. Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah. Um let me just explain something to the people that always like hear this most likely. Oh, like the queers for Palestine movement. First of all, Palestinians are diverse. They're of course queer Palestinians. That's number one. Uh openly queer Palestinians, especially as well. Um, and not only that, but also one thing that these these uh americans usually and and uh this israeli person is is uh doing in this circumstance is that they forget that these people palestinians just like uh i've i usually talk about my own personal experience like turks are not allowed to get to have their own civil liberties movement when they're too busy fighting against colonial oppression it's so fucking stupid that people always go, oh, well, uh, you wouldn't be able to be gay in Palestine. And it's like, you don't know that. You have no idea. You have no idea what that would look like because there has not been a, a, a free Palestinian nation. It's ridiculous. There's never been a moment for people to breathe so that they can, uh, you know, fix their own houses, uh, if you want to call it that. You just, it's so stupid. There's also... Uh, this is often also uh, uh, another ahistorical perspective, which is like that the the Ottoman Empire, for example, going back to that again, uh, uh, was was notoriously more open minded towards homosexuality than its Western counterparts were. Like uh, sodomy was literally decriminalized; it wasn't illegal, but then it was purposely decriminalized in the Tanzimat era in the 18th century, uh, at a time when it was absolutely illegal in uh, in the Western world, and so. Anyway, it's just it's just a very uh, weird uh, ahistorical approach that also is like very like, unnecessarily supremacist that makes it seem like um, people are in these conditions because they're just they have like wrong opinions. Yeah, I agree with you. Dude, how do you do this for like ten hours a day? <laughs> I do. I love it, man. I, I never shut the fuck up. I'm yapping. I'm yapping nonstop. When the We're Christian population stop shrinking in the Middle East, and when the Israeli Arabs stop killing one another, then and only then will there be true peace. Please like and share this video with any friend <laughs> who need. Yeah, he says. He says Arabs need to like go against their values. Okay, got it. So that's that's what the problem is. I love that that was his conclusion. Yeah, I, I mean, he really goes off the rails there in the last six, seven minutes where he stopped talking about Israel-Palestine a long time ago and now is just on a mission to brand all Palestinians as Islamic fundamentalists and then brand, and then pretend like the real problem here is Islam, which again is just like a real misreading of the situation on the ground in Israel-Palestine. Um, <clears throat> kind of you're misunderstanding what people are fighting over. Yeah. But... Um, it's also, it's also Anyways. odd because like his own, his own like, uh, Jewish theocratic state 
is currently going through internal struggles uh, as as like, uh, you know, the the Supreme Court that is supposed to be a secular institution is becoming uh, neutered and the far right uh, down to people that want down to people that are anti miscegenation and and anti LGBT are, are seizing control of an uh, of a right wing government. And he claims he hates that. I don't know if he actually hates that or if he's just simply saying that to like push for his position and or or maybe present his position as like somehow different than than other people. But it certainly doesn't seem like he hates it all that much, at least on the land grab aspect of it. And yeah, and, I, oh god, yeah. But like, I would never make the argument that uh, Israelis are monolithic, is what I'm saying, or that all Jews are the same. I would never say that it's anti-Semitic as fuck. He takes the argument that I've seen a lot of both Israelis and Jews take over the years, which is that within the community when we're speaking amongst ourselves or when we're speaking in Hebrew, we're happy to criticize our own. Um, but when it comes to putting out, <clears throat> when it comes to, uh, you know, like talking about Israel and Palestine with the world, we're all exactly the same. We all support Israel. And by the way, I think that's why American Jews have been so reluctant and so hesitant over the past, call it nine months, to speak out against what's happening within Israel um, the, the, the quote-unquote judicial reform effort to basically completely neuter the judiciary and prevent them from having any oversight over government decisions, right? But it, it, I think, you know, I actually take him at his word when he says, I, I'm, I reject the, the Netanyahu government. I would just say that he, he doesn't, he's unwilling to talk about that with other people, even though, by the way, he himself had just said, like, I'm, I actually am open, you know, his whole mantra is like, I'm open-minded, I'm happy to t criticize anybody for anything. But in fact, it's very clear, he, he, I don't think he spoke out, he, he he had literally zero negative things to say about the state of Israel. He had zero, zero criticism over any action ever taken by any Zionist or any Israeli, which is kind of undermines this whole argument about sort of like being open-minded and so on. So, yeah, what's you know. his disagreement with the Likud uh, government? Like, what, what's his what's his disagreement with the coalition government as, as it pertains to the treatment of Palestinians? It seems like he's on board one hundred percent. And considering that that is like the most important aspect politically of said government. Um, like not the social considerations, but I would say first and foremost, the permanent security state and how, uh, you know, Netanyahu is a security candidate and he's going to keep Israeli secure as opposed to like all these other pussies who have done war crimes, but not as hard. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, so what, I mean, they agree on all of it. He also thinks like uh, all Palestinians are Hamas for the most part. And then they're, they're just like interested in doing more crimes and terrorism and nothing else. I don't see a, I don't I see a disagreement it, there. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, when it, when it really comes down to the key issues, uh, the key issues dividing Israelis and Palestinians, I think most Israelis, even even on the left, kind of line up behind the right. I mean, look at what just happened with uh, <clears throat> with this new unity government. Um, you brought out, you know, Yair Lapid, and you brought out Naftali Bennett, and, or not not Naftali Bennett, but Benny Gantz. You brought these guys out of the quote unquote Israeli left. But but, uh, but like Benny Gantz is a great example, right? Benny Gantz is a great example. It's like it, these guys are. I mean, even the labor governments have all personally been involved directly in mass expulsion and and like atrocities, uh, both in their, both when they were in positions of power and even before when they were in the IDF when they were serving as a as like a, you know like a defense minister or some shit. Sorry, I cut you off again. Hundred percent. No, no, oh. I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with your point. I mean, look, one it was exception. Benny Gantz. What? Go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just going to, I was just going to say Benny Gantz is the one who I think back in was it 2014 bragged about sending Gaza back to the Stone Age. Yeah, that was how he campaigned. That was his, that was his political campaign. That was his platform. It was look, you should elect me because I have committed war crimes against the Palestinians in Gaza. That's why yeah. I'm, I should be Israeli Prime Minister, and that's the Israeli left. Yeah. Um, except for one exception, by the way, I, I must uh, hype, uh, hype him up. Uh, Ofer Kasif, uh, the, the uh, communist uh, party member who was just suspended from the Knesset for uh, doing something that is literally incredibly brave, okay? Um, he just had uh, two weeks of, of pay suspended. Uh, he's, an Israeli, he's an Israeli lawmaker. He was the one who originally said uh, that uh, pogroms against the Palestinians are responsible for the terrible attacks. 
and he uh, he spoke out. He spoke out against the occupation. He spoke out against the apartheid. And he recently, today, uh, was was expelled from the Knesset and and had his pay uh, docked for two weeks. And um, as far as I understand, I think like he. Yeah, I mean, he's just suspended for the time being, but he could literally go to jail for saying these things. Right now, under the under the current coalition government, um, you could go to jail for speaking out against uh, the apartheid, speaking out against the occupation, speaking out against IDF actions under a, a law that declares that if you hurt the IDF morale, you can go to jail. It's currently being used against Isra uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, but it will inevitably be used against... <laughs> Israeli citizens of Israel as well. Yeah, I love this guy, Olfair. He's, he, I mean, I've, I've been following him for a while. He's a, he's, he speaks truth to power. He's, he's about as left as it gets on the Israeli political spectrum. Um, and yeah, what's happening right now is it, it, with these new um, kind of emergency laws being put in place by the government is it's Orwellian. I mean, you have, have you seen the videos with Israeli police walking into stores in East Jerusalem? You know, the one where he grabs a Palestinian guy's phone and says, open it up. Show me yeah. what Instagram posts you've shared recently. I mean, this is, this is literally what George Orwell predicted in 1984. Police going door to door looking and seeing what you're liking on social media. It's insanity. Yeah. I mean, it's Israel may may be a democracy if you're Jew if you're a Jew, but if you're a Palestinian, it's a police state. Yeah, but but the point is that um, in order to continuously justify the maintenance of a violent apartheid state, you inevitably have to take uh, you know you inevitably will take fascist measures such as this one, and that will end up harming the Israelis that feel comfortable in the in-group right now. If you might be, you might be an Israeli Jew thinking like, oh, well, I'm fine. You know, this is, this is, this is okay. This is all right. I'm genuinely scared. This is a security concern that I have. So I guess like at the end of the day, we got to be a little violent. And if you don't take a deep breath and recognize that, no, that violence is justified, uh, by, by increasingly more, uh, more restrictive, uh, a more restrictive government apparatus and a military state uh, that that uh, out group will inevitably grow and that in group will inevitably shrink. And you might find yourself outside of that uh, in group uh, before you know it. I don't know what to tell you. You just, this is the whole principle behind uh, the, the famous poem of like, first they came for the communists. I said nothing because I wasn't a communist, right? Like that, that's what that was. It was the, it was the, the crippling uh, uh, slow burn of fascism. And how uh, slowly but surely this this uh, suicidal pact ends up um, ends up pushing you into the out group as well. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Hassan, uh, this has been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on your your stream. I thank you I, so much been, for coming on. It's been a lot on. of fun. It's, yeah, it's been I, my pleasure, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for having me on, and I. I really uh, love chatting with you and I'm really happy we did this because I, literally, I kid you not, I had multiple friends send me this video asking for my, being like, dude, you have to talk about this video. You have to produce some content about this video. And then literally the next day you, uh, you pinged me. So I just wanted to say thanks again. Yeah, no, thank you so much for coming on. You were wonderful. And, uh, you know, I hope to, I hope to talk to you again. Uh, is there anything you want to promote other than palestinenexus.com? Look, if you want to follow me on Twitter, my hash my <clears throat> my hashtag is underscore Zach Foster, and you can follow me on Instagram. I don't even fucking know what my handle is over there. And yeah, just just uh, subscribe to my newsletter. That would be awesome. Yeah, it's PalestineNexus dot com, and the name of the newsletter is Palestine in your inbox. All right, bye bye bye. Okay, hadi good shudus avi. Hadi good shudus. Yalla. Hadi bye bye. All right, that was Zach Foster, like I said. Uh, that was a wonderful... What the fuck? It, it, wait, what time is it? It's fucking five. I had him on at two. I had him on for three hours, dude. God damn. Three hours. That's crazy. Uh, I, the things I make people put up with, it's it's unimaginable. You know what I'm saying? It's just like... How the fuck am I allowed to do such horrifying things to people? I don't know. Got me through my four and a half hour va uh, wait at the DMV. Tur it's, I turned in for the whole three hours. Thanks for the educational opportunity. I 
I hope that was instructive. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Two points. Palestinians were stripped of their weapons when the Arab armies came in 48 as to limit the chaos of the local resistance and 48 was next to non-existent. Arafat did try getting Arab Jews to go back to their countries, even through offering money, tried to use their same weapon against them, got agreement of Morocco, and was talking to others. Needless to say, only few families agreed, like you guessed, who would want to go back. Yeah. Um, now you know how I felt making you do sodas. Well, sodas was incredible. 